While we've said it before, we'll say it again. Vladimir Putin is in trouble, and it's worse than you think. The man who has ruled Russia with an iron fist for more than 20 years finally jeopardized his own future when he invaded Ukraine last spring. That decision has led to a string of remarkable defeats and failures, which has exposed cracks in Putin's rule for the first time in decades. Now, a year and a half later, they are presenting enormous challenges that he might not be able to crush with force. From the outside, Putin's continued belligerence towards Ukraine and the West is puzzling, since it has left him in a far worse spot geopolitically than he was at the start of 2022. But as William Shakespeare once wrote, uneasy wears the head that lies the crown. Putin has been uneasy in his seat of power for many, many years. This insecurity has driven him to obsession and helped him turn into the ruthless, corrupt, and jingoistic dictator we see today, one who silences any dissent inside his country, has journalists and defectors abroad murdered in broad daylight, and even faced a brief rebellion from his own confidants earlier this year. He can't even admit that this is a war, violently suppressing anyone who doesn't refer to it as a special military operation. But all these mistakes and tactics have also exposed the cracks in Putin's rule. His miscalculations about Ukraine and his ability to succeed there have left him weak, isolated, and flailing. He faces simmering tensions at home, an exodus of young and talented individuals from Russia, and a conscript army seemingly incapable of attacking or defending well enough to win any real victories. And despite its slow pace, Putin now also faces a Ukrainian counteroffensive which may retake even the small parts of the country which Putin has been able to hold on to. While it's unclear how successful the effort will prove to be, the counteroffensive seems to be developing along three axes which could seriously challenge Putin's capabilities. One is the southern Zaporizhia Oblast, one to the east in the Donetsk Oblast, and the other around the destroyed northern city of Bakhmut. Ukraine also continues to launch cross-border raids into Russia's territory near the city of Belgorod, where Russian military bloggers have claimed that entire regiments have been wiped out. From all these sources and more, it's clear that Putin faces numerous challenges to his future and possibly his life. It's also clear that he cannot afford to admit that he's screwed up, as his efforts to crush dissent and keep the Russian people on his side have been intense. And yet even Putin has had to admit in recent weeks that the war he and his yes-men launched is going poorly. Ukraine's counteroffensive, which some have claimed is going poorly, has still been effective enough that Putin admitted on June 9, 2023 that, in recent days we have seen significant losses in Ukraine. While this is clearly understating things quite a bit, it's also among the very first times Putin has been forced to acknowledge his problems at all. From a brutal dictator, this is about as close as it gets to a mere culpa. And things don't look to be getting much better. Despite taking heavy losses in their initial assaults of Russian positions, Ukraine's armed forces have made significant progress in breaking through fortified defensive lines in the country's southeast. Specifically, the most notable gains have been south of the Dnipro River, which divides the half-liberated city of Kherson. Russian military bloggers reported that up to seven boats, each carrying six to seven people, had landed near the village of Kazashi Lahiri, east of Kherson city, on Tuesday, and broke through Russian defensive lines. It was claimed that the Ukrainian soldiers had advanced up to 800 meters after getting to the riverbank, though it appeared Russian forces had some success in fighting them back. The Russian-imposed head of the occupied part of the Kherson Oblast, Vladimir Saldo, claimed the Ukrainian raid had been repelled. However, the Institute for the Study of War (ISW), a think tank in Washington which closely tracks the conflict, said that it appeared that the limited raid may have had more success than Saldo had acknowledged. ISW wrote in a recent update that, the majority of prominent Russian military bloggers claimed that Ukrainian forces managed to utilize tactical surprise and land on the East Bank before engaging Russian forces in small arms exchanges, and Saldo was likely purposefully trying to refute claims of Ukrainian presence in this area to avoid creating panic in the already delicate Russian information space. The report added that satellite imagery suggested that a major battle had taken place and that by the end of the day on 8th of August, Many Russian sources had updated their claims to report that Russian forces retained control over Kazakhi Lahiri, having pushed Ukrainian forces back to the shoreline, and that small arms skirmishes are occurring in shoreline areas near Kazakhi Lahiri and other East Bank settlements. This development in the fighting also poses a major threat to Russian supply lines and the key transportation hub of Melitopol, which serves as a gateway to the still-occupied port cities of Berdyansk and Mariupol. 
If Ukraine is able to retake these cities, it could cut off Russian support to nearly a third of their soldiers, stationed in the southeast and on the Crimean Peninsula. There are already numerous reports of sabotage train lines between Crimea and Melitopol, which may be impacting Russia's ability to move troops and supplies from one city to the other. These attacks are also only a small part of the broader Ukrainian sabotage operations which continue across the battle space, as well as in Russia itself. There have been twice as many of this type of attack in the first six months of 2023 than in the entire previous year. Besides psychologically messing with Russian troops, operations like this also help to weaken key defensive positions. If Ukraine can use them to escalate into a full assault on Melitopol, Berdyansk and Mariupol, that will leave only a single reliable supply route from Russia into Crimea, via the already damaged Kerch Bridge. The previous attack on that bridge, which remains unconfirmed but has been attributed to Ukraine, proved that this is vulnerable to sabotage. From reports and footage, it appeared as though a truck bomb was responsible, one which originated from within Russia's own borders. If Ukraine can pull off another similar attack able to destroy the bridge, it will leave the tens of thousands of Russian troops in Crimea essentially stranded. Even more important, it will leave no way for Russia to move heavy equipment like tanks, artillery systems, and supply vehicles onto the peninsula. This could prove disastrous and severely limit Putin's ability to sustain the war effort. In addition to giving ground under Ukrainian assaults south of the Dnipro, Russian troops have also been forced to retreat on the northern and southern axes of the conflict, near the ruins of the city of Bakhmut. When the Russian PMC Wagner Group announced that they had finally retaken Bakhmut several months back, they also announced that their forces would be pulling away from the front line. This was likely due to the many months of heavy losses, which would also eventually lead Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin to stage his ill-fated mutiny against Putin back in July. Prigozhin announced that he was turning Bakhmut over to the regular Russian forces. Within days of this taking place, Ukraine began systematic attacks on both the northern and southern approaches to the city, working to encircle the Russian troops inside. Ukraine's Deputy Defense Minister Hanna Maliar recently stated that, in the Bakhmut sector, three square kilometers 1.2 square miles were liberated last week, and that, in total, 40 square kilometers 15.5 square miles have been liberated on the southern flank of the Bakhmut sector. But this may also continue to shift in Ukraine's favor, as the country receives more and more advanced military supplies from the US and NATO. Some of these have already arrived and been put to use such as armored vehicles like the German-made Leopard tanks and US Bradley fighting vehicles. Most weapon systems manufactured in the West come with advanced targeting and night warfare capabilities, which Russia has either too few of or lacks entirely. These capabilities have allowed Ukrainian forces to undertake a large number of successful night operations, something experts have recently started pointing to as a major factor behind Ukrainian battlefield gains. Another source of Ukrainian dominance has been the influx of US-made precision artillery, such as the HIMARS rocket system and GPS-guided Excalibur shells. These have provided Ukraine with the ability to target Russian ammunition depots, fuel production facilities, and command and control centers. Combined with the power of long-range Western rockets such as the British-supplied Storm Shadow missile, this has led to several devastating strikes far behind Russian lines. Just weeks ago, Ukraine struck two of the bridges in the Crimean Peninsula, with at least one hit by Storm Shadow missiles, according to Ukrainian and Russian officials. And that same day, Ukraine's Ministry of Defense released images confirming the arrival of Scalp EG missiles, the French version of the Storm Shadow. The weapons being delivered may also be even more powerful than publicly disclosed. A colonel in Kyiv's Air Defense Command, who was not named, recently told the Times of London that the missiles in Ukraine's possession have twice their publicized range, about 310 miles rather than 155 miles advertised by its manufacturer. There are still options for more powerful systems to be delivered as well. Biden is said to be debating the delivery of the ultra-long-range ATAC-Ms or Army Tactical Missile Systems. ATAC-Ms has a routine range of around 200 miles, as well as highly accurate precision targeting capabilities. Meanwhile, Russia has run so low on ammunition that Putin has been forced to turn to countries like North Korea and Iran to supply artillery shells, some of which are likely more than 50 years old. Reportedly, during a recent test of similar ammunition by North Korea, over a quarter of the shells failed to detonate at all. 
Iran is also selling their least expensive drones to Russia, including the Shahed-129, Shahed-191, and Mahaja-6 models, which Russia has used to launch indiscriminate attacks on civilian targets and energy infrastructure. While these drones are deadly and terrifying, they are unlikely to be enough to turn the tide of the war. With new Russian weaknesses being exposed every week, Putin also increasingly runs the risk of his top generals turning on him, or ordinary Russians rising up over the staggering losses and failure to achieve any real gains. The frustration over the war is becoming more and more noticeable, even among the tightly censored and controlled Russian media. Igor Strelkov is a former Russian intelligence officer who has boasted that he pulled the war's trigger by leading Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea and of ordering the torture and execution of pro-Ukrainian officials, police officers, and war prisoners in Donetsk. Until recently, Strelkov was a rising star in the world of pro-war Russian telegram bloggers. But after Prigozhin's mutiny, Strelkov posted, among other insults, that for 23 years at the helm of Russia was a nobody who could fool most Russians. Three days later, he was arrested by Putin's security forces. The discontent has even spread to members of the Duma, Putin's hand-picked group of cronies who form the Russian legislature. One of its most influential members, Konstantin Zachulin, even recently dared to criticize the war in an international forum. Zachulin, who boasts close ties to top leaders of the FSB, said at a conference on the future of Ukraine that Russia had so far failed in all its war efforts, and that some of them had become senseless. Referencing the popular Russian rationale for the war, he stated that the original aims were denazification, demilitarization, neutrality for Ukraine, and the defense of the residents of Donetsk and Luhansk. On which of these points have we reached results today? Not one. Combined with Prigozhin's well-publicized mutiny and flight to Belarus, episodes like this show a Putin who is beginning to lose his grip on the levers of power. In a recent analysis, Tatyana Stanovaya, senior fellow at the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center, said Prigozhin had effectively chipped away at Putin's power vertical, or ability to rule effectively from the top down. Because of this, she argues, turmoil from the war is now producing dozens of mini Prigozhins, who are not as smart as the caterer turned mercenary, but have become sure in recent months that post-Putin Russia is already here, even as Putin remains in charge. Putin also faces new international challenges to his authority and possibly freedom. Since even before February 2022, there have been numerous reports of the systematic abduction and relocation of children from the occupied areas of Ukraine. In March of 2023, this led to an arrest warrant for Putin being issued by the International Criminal Court on charges for war crimes. While not an immediate threat, these are further isolating him internationally, putting even his trips to non-aligned countries into jeopardy. For instance, in August, South Africa is hosting a summit for a meeting of the BRICS Group, a loose alliance of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But the month before, South Africa's government stated that Putin would not be attending the summit, and that Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov would attend instead. This was largely due to concerns over whether they would have to act on the international arrest warrant due to building public pressure. Developments like this isolate Putin even further, limiting the amount of places he can travel on state business and undermining his legitimacy as leader of Russia. And allegations of mass kidnapping are just the tip of the iceberg as far as war crimes are concerned. The Russian armed forces under direct control of Putin and his generals have been responsible for thousands of acts of torture and murder throughout the war and occupation of Ukraine. For instance, in the town of Bukha, on the outskirts of Kyiv, over 450 civilians were executed with hands tied behind their back and dumped in the streets. An inquiry by Radio Free Europe also discovered the use of a basement beneath a campground as a torture chamber. Many bodies were found mutilated and burnt, while girls as young as 14 reported being raped by Russian soldiers. This is just one massacre among hundreds, many of which are also being investigated by the International Criminal Court. Additionally, the US is currently hosting Ukrainian prosecutors to help them prepare to prosecute such acts. Ultimately, all of the horrifying violence can be laid at Putin's feet. This isn't just guesswork either. He's made it publicly clear, such as by giving medals to the unit responsible for carrying out the murders and other atrocities at Bukha. He has also received charges of ecocide for the destruction of the enormous Nova Kokovka Dam, while Putin called the move barbaric and denied Russian involvement. But investigations have all concluded that Russia was responsible, as it controlled the dam before its destruction, 
while experts have concluded that the breach was caused by an internal explosion of hundreds of pounds of explosives. The dam was designed by the Soviets to withstand a nuclear attack, making it highly unlikely that any missile could have caused the damage it sustained. The dam's destruction is yet another terrible crime for which Putin is to blame. The event also suggests several more implications of his growing desperation. For example, more than 80% of the drinking and agricultural water in Crimea came straight from the lake that the dam controlled via canal. Putin's likely destruction of the dam may signal that he is aware he could lose control over Crimea at some point in the coming months, and is unwilling to let Ukraine have it either. By some estimates, it may take more than a decade for previous levels of drinking water to return to the peninsula. This is the move of a desperate tyrant lashing out at enemies and lacking the long-term thinking necessary to hold on to power securely. Another factor, often discussed but still crucial, is the damage that Putin has done to Russia's economy and diplomatic presence around the world. Take oil. Russia has been one of the world's top three oil producers for decades, behind only the United States and Saudi Arabia. But the harsh sanctions, price caps, and export controls imposed by the US and Europe after the invasion have hit Russia's oil sector hard. This is despite Russia offering a massive $20 per barrel discount in the cost of its crude oil exports, in the hopes of using new buyers like India and China to replace EU members who have largely stopped buying. But that discount, combined with lower volume of sales, means a shortfall of over $65 billion per year. That's not to mention other price declines from the pre-invasion oil market. All things considered, Russia is likely to see a 2023 decline in oil and gas revenue of over $180 billion. A drop of this magnitude is likely to hit ordinary Russians, and possibly even the oligarchs, quite hard. The expenses of the invasion are also hitting the Russian economy more directly now. Putin recently imposed an extra 5% tax on extra profit made by Russian businesses, something which is basically determined by his cronies in the finance ministry. Another area Russia's economy has been hit hard is in its global military sales. Back in 2011, Russia nearly matched the US in volume of global arms sales. But as the country has become more isolated due to warmongering and its equipment has been shown ineffective, exports have plummeted more than 70%, with 2023 sales to only 12 countries. Western sanctions have also destroyed Russia's ability to obtain advanced computer chips for its modern military equipment, throwing doubt on whether it will be able to produce such systems for more than another year. That's not even getting into the enormous destruction of tanks, artillery, planes, and over 250,000 soldiers. All of this suggests one thing. Putin messed up badly. His war of imperialism has now turned into a series of self-inflicted wounds, which have brought Russia to its lowest point in decades, economically, militarily, and politically. With two new countries joining NATO and Ukraine's membership on the horizon, every aim of the war has become an abject failure. It seems likely that sooner, rather than later, these mistakes will eventually catch up to Putin and be his undoing. But what do you think? Will Putin's war end up pushing him from power? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. If you've been watching the news recently, it's no secret that things aren't going well for Russian President Vladimir Putin. In fact, according to former CIA Chief of Russian Operations Steve Hall, Putin's troubles are mounting at breakneck speed, and they might just be enough to break the infamous dictator. In this video, let's take a look at some of Hall's predictions about what might happen in Ukraine and just how much trouble Russia and its leader are really in. To start with, let's consider firepower. It's hard to turn on a TV without seeing something about Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky asking for more ammunition. For instance, there have been multiple high-profile stories about how Ukraine's air defenses are short on missiles, leading some to speculate that Russia's air force would finally gain control of the skies and crush Ukrainian resistance. But the truth was far less ominous. Ukrainians had simply stated that at the current burn rate of ammunition, they might run out in a few months, not right away. In much the same way, there have been multiple stories on Ukraine facing shortages of shells for its artillery and other systems like the HIMARS rockets. But what these reports don't capture is that Russia is having the same type of problems, just on a far larger scale. Russian ammunition shortages have become just as severe as those on the Ukrainian side. But unlike Ukraine, Russia does not have the same huge coalition of powerful and well-armed Western allies willing to send it more materiel. 
Instead, its allies are limited to Iran, Belarus, and reportedly South Africa, China, and a few others. To date, the main advantage Russia has had over Ukraine comes from its Soviet legacy. Modern Russia contains massive stockpiles of Soviet weaponry and equipment, left over from the enormous arms buildups of the Cold War. However, after more than a year of war in Ukraine, that stockpile is closer than ever to being depleted. One sign of this came several months ago, when Ukraine announced that for the first time, it had achieved artillery parity with Russia. Throughout most of the conflict, Russia had fired more than 20 times the shells of Ukraine, but for the first time, they began firing the same volume of shells, substantially leveling the playing field. This was aided by HIMARS strikes and sabotage of ammunition depots far behind Russian lines, so that by early to mid-2023, Ukraine was outfiring Russia 6 to 1. As Hall has noted, I think the pattern that we've seen over this year, the first year of the Ukrainian war, has been the West very slowly, very cautiously. I think probably not to overwhelm Ukrainian logistics capabilities, ramping up the type of weaponry and ammunition that goes with that. The huge shift in firepower had a noticeable effect on Russia's attempted offensive operations. Due to the poor training, planning, and leadership of Russian ground troops, most of their operations during the war have been heavily reliant on huge artillery barrages. But once their overwhelming artillery superiority went away, it's probably unsurprising that Russian infantry and tank forces haven't fared very well. This is somewhat expected from a military made up of mainly green and poorly trained conscripts, where most of the professional soldiers are more interested in lining their own pockets than defending a homeland. Most of Russia's actual territorial gains since the start of the invasion last year have been achieved by the Wagner Group, a huge private military contractor run by close Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Unlike most of the Russian armed forces, the Wagner Group is well-trained and equipped, allowing them to avoid some of the most basic pitfalls like walking into endless ambushes or fighting with no boots. One of the Wagner Group's most successful, yet horrible strategies has been the use of prisoners from Russian detention centers and jails, promising them freedom if they can survive a tour fighting in Ukraine. Leaked documents and phone calls suggest that Prigozhin and Putin never had any intention of letting most of these prisoners back into Russian society. Instead, tactics show that they have used them over and over again in the so-called human wave attacks, which helped Russia retake the devastated city of Bakhmut. Wagner released thousands of these armed prisoners who threw themselves against Ukrainian positions and risked being shot by other Russian troops if they retreated. When the Ukrainians opened their lines and revealed their primary defenses, Wagner's regular units would then begin direct assaults on the weakest points, often expending huge amounts of artillery. This strategy proved to be highly effective, especially for a military with such little emphasis on preserving the lives of its own troops. In Bakhmut and several other locations, Ukraine was eventually pushed back due to this strategy, which resembled Russia's actions during the huge sieges of World War II. But Wagner remains not just reliant on prisoners, but also on the continual influx of supplies from Russia's defense ministry. While the group has purchased a substantial amount of its own equipment over the years, inside Ukraine it has proved to be heavily reliant on Russian resupply to keep up the pressure on Ukraine. This has proved to be a significant weakness, and it could also mean the loss of Bakhmut, and more valuable territory during the Ukrainian counteroffensive taking place this summer. Much of the issue has to do with the way that Russia, and Putin in particular, go about politics. One thing Hall has pointed out is that to keep his firm hold on power, Putin must ensure that none of his direct subordinates are too successful, or run the risk of being overthrown. To do so, he often sets elements of his own government against each other, with advisors and senior military planners competing, often viciously. This applies to Prigozhin too. The man sometimes known as Putin's chef experienced a meteoric rise to his current position. Despite private military contractors technically being against Russian law, Putin allowed Prigozhin to create Wagner, on the condition that the group be firmly loyal to Putin, not the Russian state. This formed the basis for Wagner's various interventions in Africa and the Middle East, where it expanded Putin's military reach enriched Russian business interests and left a trail of atrocities in its wake. Wagner's success launched Prigozhin into Putin's inner circle. This has not gone over well with other top Russian officials, such as Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. Shoigu seems to believe that Prigozhin's ambitions and control over a private military are setting him up as the next head of the Russian military, or as Putin's personal successor. 
He may have reason to worry about his own job too, as Russia's military prowess under him has been less than stellar. Due to its enormous losses, the country is actually the number one supplier of material to Ukraine, having abandoned roughly 500 since the start of its invasion. It has also lost advanced air defense systems and huge amounts of ammo. All this is a very bad look for Shoigu, and has led some to speculate about the reasons why Putin has dismissed multiple of his other top generals, but not Shoigu himself. One answer is that he has kept Shoigu in charge of the military because without Putin's support, Shoigu is a goner and he knows it. Unlike the politically adept Prigozhin, Shoigu is an outsider to the corrupt ladder of Russian politics, having come up through the ranks from essentially nothing. Shoigu thus has few friends in Russia's top echelons and does not pose a real risk to Putin's power and control of the state. Ironically, his rise was also as a logistics officer, where he was able to skim or divert large amounts of money from defense projects. Some US military officials have even referred to him as responsible for dismantling much of Russia's capabilities. Prigozhin has also repeatedly attacked Shoigu for his failures in Ukraine, while at the same time pointing out that Wagner has achieved what he could not in places like Bakhmut. It would be easy for Putin to replace the somewhat unpopular Shoigu with Prigozhin, but doing so would potentially endanger Putin himself. Shoigu has also tried to push back from his position atop the Russian military command. He took credit for the capture of Solodar, a salt mining town which Wagner actually seems to have done most of the fighting for. Prigozhin actually took to social media to refute these claims and bash Shoigu. And just as Wagner was about to capture Bakhmut, it happened again. As Wagner troops were only miles from retaking the last of the town, Shoigu pulled their supplies just to hurt his rival. Now Russia's issues with supplies have compromised its entire war effort and become a masterclass in how not to handle logistics. In response to Shoigu's actions in Bakhmut, Prigozhin took to social media once again, threatening to pull Wagner troops out of the area entirely, leaving the ineffective Russian military on its own. Obviously, this would have been a disaster, and made Ukraine's counter-offensive that much easier. Shoigu, of course, claimed that he was not manipulating supply lines, and that Wagner had actually received everything it had been promised. When Prigozhin took a stand and declared that he would pull out all Wagner troops from Bakhmut by May 10th, the supplies miraculously started flowing again, only to be reduced just days later. So is this just a petty personal struggle, or are Russia's supply issues really that bad? Well, it appears that things may actually be that disastrous, with personal rivalries like this being just one factor among many. While Russia's artillery and other heavy guns were firing almost non-stop last year, now they sit inactive for days at a time. This has allowed Ukrainian forces more opportunity to respond, and may be one reason why the counter-offensive began now. In Bakhmut, recent reports suggest that Ukraine is now advancing south of the city, along a salient about four miles deep, pushing Russian forces back. In part, this is possible thanks to the issues between Shoigu and Prigozhin, and due to the fact that Wagner has been doing the brunt of the fighting, while Russian troops secure its flanks. These flanking troops have been attempting to cut off the city for months, by capturing the main supply routes to Ukrainian positions. As Wagner closed in on the city and Ukrainian defenders were pushed back, the flank attacks have increased in frequency and intensity. Even as Wagner troops reportedly ran out of ammunition, it seemed as though Shoigu was content to let them take the losses, while using his troops to secure the area. Ukraine has not given up easily though. It reinforced defenders around Bakhmut with special forces, who managed to grind the Spring Russian offensive to a halt. Since Wagner was unable to launch major attacks against Ukraine from the center, it has allowed Ukrainian forces to reinforce their flanks and launch the deadly counterattacks, which continue today. Prigozhin has once again complained about all this on social media, and his outbursts are nearly intense enough to constitute treason against the state. He has claimed that regular Russian forces broke and ran at the first hint of a Ukrainian attack, blaming Shoigu for the current situation. But from Ukrainian sources on the ground, it appears as though many of the troops cutting and running may actually be Wagner units. Such reports seem to have angered Prigozhin enough that he has actually lashed out at Putin online, in ways which could be very bad for his health. In a recent broadcast following more losses at Bakhmut, he stated that the happy grandfather thinks that he is good. If he turns out to be right, then God may grant everyone health. But what will the country do? Our children, grandchildren, who are the future of Russia, and how can we win this war if, by chance, it turns out that this grandfather is a complete shithead? Putin is frequently referred to as Russia's grandfather, and Prigozhin seems to be directly attacking him in a way that no other Russian official has dared to do. 
Prigozhin quickly walked back his attack in later interviews, careful to state that many in Russian leadership could be called grandfather. But most likely, the lashing out was a sign that Prigozhin is increasingly frustrated with the state of the war effort and blames Putin for the untenable situation. This is also likely to be one of the biggest issues Putin has yet faced, with his two top military leaders essentially sabotaging each other. The Russian offensive in Bakhmut has not been nearly as successful as it should have been. Just as Russia started to make headway against Ukraine, the supply issues and infighting may have doomed them once again. What's more, the actual prospect of victory in Bakhmut is essentially meaningless, as the city has never held any real strategic significance. Its only true value is political and ideological, as Putin sees Bakhmut as a symbol of his invasion's success, and losing it would undermine Russian support for the war effort. And Bakhmut is just one piece of the larger picture. This type of drama is playing out across the battle space in Ukraine, as different factions of the Russian military compete against each other for plunder and political influence. But we should remember that at least some of this insanity is by Putin's design, intended to make sure that no one faction can challenge him for dominance in Russia. And while hundreds of thousands of ordinary Russians have paid with their lives, the constant violence in Ukraine still seems far from the gilded halls of the Kremlin and Putin's vacation palaces. Even so, Putin knows that he has risked a lot in this conflict. As Hall points out, as to whether or not Putin will run out of something, willpower, ammunition, men, that he wants to send into the meat grinder, I would be surprised if Putin were to just say, OK, no, this is a big mistake, or I've gone too far, or we don't have enough resources. This is one of the significant problems with this, is where does Putin go from here? If he somehow gives up and surrenders, that's going to have negative implications for him back in Russia. But if he doesn't win, that will too, and it looks like he's not going to win. I'm glad I'm not in Vladimir Putin's position right now because he doesn't have a whole lot of space to work with. And in this latest stage of the war, Putin's troubles are increasing again. This time not even due to the incompetence of his own forces. The issue has to do with Ukraine's increasing access to long-range precision weaponry. Since the beginning of the conflict, Kyiv has been asking the West for more materiel, but they have been slow to materialize. It took months for the HIMARS missile system to be delivered. But once it was, Ukraine gained the ability to strike static targets several dozen miles away with deadly accuracy. And in the time since, the West seems to have become more receptive to handing over increasingly powerful weaponry. One of these is the Army Tactical Missile System, or ATAC-Ms, capable of striking targets up to 190 miles away. If the US decides to give these or other similarly capable weapons to the Ukrainians, it will put many major Russian cities and military installations within striking distance. Similarly, the United Kingdom recently agreed to provide Kyiv with the Storm Shadow cruise missile. With sophisticated stealth capabilities and a range more than twice that of the HIMARS, the Storm Shadow will allow Ukraine to hit targets far behind enemy lines as the counter-offensive ramps up. UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace confirmed that some of these weapons are already in-country, meaning we will likely start to see their effects soon. The UK has over 900 Storm Shadows in its arsenal, meaning that a sizable number will arrive this summer. While Ukraine's government has vowed not to strike into Russia itself, there are signs that it already is using drone attacks and border incursions. It is a simple reality that Ukraine cannot win the war without destroying at least the Russian bases resupplying the front, and this will almost certainly require strikes inside Russia proper. The same may hold true for F-16s, and other advanced fighter jets. As Hall has stated, remember a few months ago when they said, we're not going to send tanks, so that has shifted. Will this be another thing that shifts? Perhaps some of it will depend on what happens on the ground in the next year. A final element of the war's trajectory is the possibility of more external intervention, some of which might favor Russia. If Ukraine continues striking deeply into Russian territory, some experts have argued that China may soon get involved. Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping remain tacit allies, and China would not like the idea that a smaller neighbor supplied by the West could strike inside its borders. This and the CCP's affinity for fellow authoritarian regimes makes their position something of a question mark. As Hall notes, you know, the Chinese position is really interesting and very complicated. The Chinese have very long-term goals. They want to be the primary superpower economically and militarily within the next 50 years. But by the same token, they share a certain ideology with Russia, and that is that democracies are a threat to them. 
So how is China going to play a neutral, moderating position in this when it's pretty clear they're coming down on Russia's side? Clearly that helps Russia, so China is walking a really fine tightrope at this point. However, there is also the possibility that China will attempt to stay in Ukraine's good graces in order to offer economic assistance rebuilding the country through loans and development projects. This is the strategy that Xi has taken with his massive Belt and Road project, and if applied to Ukraine, could generate substantial leverage over the West. Hall argues that if China wants a future, it's going to have to have really good economic relations with the West, the EU, the United States, and other developed countries. And a relationship with Russia is mutually exclusive, so if I'm Russia, I'm probably thinking that over the long term, the Chinese are not necessarily going to be on our side. All these considerations will play into how the war changes course in the months ahead. Russia's disorganization under Putin, Ukraine's increasing military assistance from the West, and the potential for more external involvement will all shape how effective the Ukrainian counteroffensive is this summer. They will also determine the long-term prospects for peace, as any potential peace treaty will not emerge until one side is definitively crippled or forced to make concessions by its citizens or allied nations. When the dust finally settles, one thing is clear. Russia and Ukraine will both be changed forever, all due to the greed and ambition of one man, Vladimir Putin. So will Hall's prediction for the war pan out, or will there be another major deciding factor in how things go this summer and beyond? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a disaster. And it's no wonder. The man is a paranoid megalomaniac who goes around poisoning his opposition's underpants, uses outdated Soviet-era weapons and tactics on the battlefield, and isolates himself from the world to a degree that is clearly eating away at his sanity. And that's not all. If you haven't heard this before, we're here to talk about it today. Putin is a thief. While there are numerous military mistakes that Russian generals and armies have made, the mistakes begin at the top with Putin himself. No surprise there, right? But you may be surprised at just how fast and crazy this sea of mistakes, dirty little secrets and even just basic stupidity really is. Here's the scoop. You can tell how big a thief Vladimir Putin is by how many articles and documentaries have been made about how he's stolen Russia blind. One pertinent article is literally titled just that, Stealing Russia Blind. Written by Harley Balzer and published in the Journal of Democracy, in the article, Balzer points out that Putin has established a sistema, the Russian word for an established and accepted system, based on massive predation that has produced the most unequal wealth distribution in any developed economy. Estimates have suggested that Putin and his oligarch cronies have stolen more than a trillion dollars worth from the Russian economy since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. But that is just the beginning of Putin's kleptocracy story. Putin's experience with government-level theft started early long before he reached Russia's throne, when he managed to steal $124 million worth of funding that was designed to feed the starving population of St. Petersburg in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1996, he was able to protect his boss, St. Petersburg Mayor Anatoly Sobchak, when Sobchak lost an election over a corruption scandal and fled the country, an escape arranged by Putin himself. That ability to protect his corrupt friends is what garnered attention by the equally corrupt Russian President Boris Yeltsin in 1999, who was leaving office during an investigation into his own massive corruption. Estimates by four different worldwide organizations of the level of endemic corruption in Russia suggested that at a minimum, $30 billion a year was being stolen from the Russian economy. That amounts to 10 to 12 percent of the national GDP. And that was just what the investigators could prove. Eventually, those losses cost his country dearly. Money that should have gone to train soldiers, to modernize equipment, to keep planes flying and tanks in working order, to simply fill up their gas tanks. All this had been stolen from Russia's military. That higher figure of $1 trillion worth of theft was mentioned again by investigator Bill Browder, who also suggested that Putin's net worth alone is in excess of $200 billion. These funds could have also gone to better roads, better healthcare and better everything in Russia, not just a better military. But it's the kleptocracy rampant in Russia's military that the invasion of Ukraine has brought front and center. Russia has been undergoing a much vaunted modernization effort that's been ongoing since 2008, but these efforts have failed to root out Putin's personally embedded sistema, which is present in all levels of Russia's military. The army's infantry commanders frequently inflate the number of active personnel in their units 
and from the excess, those commanders steal the surplus funds for themselves. The accounting is continually plagued by falsified numbers of both men and material, which leads to false appraisal of the unit's true combat capability. But the units are not only plagued by missing soldiers and supplies, their lower-level commanders and sometimes the soldiers themselves have sold available gear and even their own vehicles gasoline for money or traded them for alcohol. All branches of the armed forces generally have unreliable and opaque reporting up and down the command chain, which has led Russia's leadership to believe its forces were better, quantitatively and qualitatively, than they really were at the start of the invasion. And with the lack of available gear for their newly mobilized troops, some soldiers or their families have had to resort to buying their own weapons, their own bulletproof gear, and sometimes even their uniforms. That's just… sad. And weird. And it's about to get weirder. Putin is personally responsible for the three segments that underpin his rule as an autocrat. He perpetuates his rule by maintaining absolute secrecy. He isolates himself from reality by listening to only a very select few advisors. And he surrounded himself with yes-men whose only redeeming quality is their unwavering loyalty. Since the beginning of the invasion in February of 2022, Moscow has, if anything, doubled down on silencing frank discussion of the conflict even going so far as to criminalize assessments of combat deaths and forecasts about how the war might unfold. Criticism of the war, it's still technically a crime to call Putin's special operation a war, though some media darlings have finally used that term, remains completely off-limits, including discussion of military incompetence and the absence of accountability that has led to the military's serious problems inside of Ukraine. This censorship makes it hard for the military elite to get accurate information on what's going wrong in the war, which in turn hampers their efforts to correct their mistakes. Meanwhile, the level of secrecy that Putin has made an intractable part of the Russian Sistema was one of the biggest reasons for the early failure of the invasion. The self-defeating deception caused by Putin's decision to prioritize operational secrecy and domestic blindness to the impending war led to a notable lack of adequate planning. Pre-invasion secrecy led to avoidable problems that specifically affected the initial application of Russian air power. Russian pilots had gained some experience fighting air battles in Syria, but operations there had taken place over mostly uncontested desert terrain, where enemy opposition could be spotted and dealt with long before it became an actual threat. Russian pilots had almost no experience fighting over a forested country like Ukraine, a much more defensible and far larger area than the rebel-held enclaves in Syria. These pilots also hadn't trained against an opponent with any kind of layered air defenses and numerous manned portable air defense systems or man pads that Ukraine possessed. Russian pilots were given little to no training in such tactics before the invasion. That unpreparedness is partly why Russia has been unable to establish air superiority over the Ukrainian battlefield, and why they've met with such heavy losses in the air. Another factor in the failure of the air assets was how Russia decided to employ their forces. Because their ground troops were in grave danger within days of the invasion, the Russian Air Force had its primary objective switched from suppressing air defenses to providing close air support, which in turn brought them into greater danger from the numerous Western-supplied manpad systems. These missions forced Russian pilots to engage targets at low altitudes, which placed them well within the range of cheap and numerous anti-air missiles, like the US-made Stinger. After the first few months of this, Russia found itself not just suffering unacceptable losses of expensive aircraft and helicopters, but also significant drain of their trained pilots and aircrew, which take months or years worth of training to replace. And while all this is going on, Putin remains in his creepy little cave of isolation and delusions of grandeur. Not only is Putin's insistence on secrecy a major problem, but he has insulated himself from the reality of the world by relying on just a handful of advisors. By orchestrating the invasion with just a handful of military advisors, many of whom earned their positions not by being good strategists, but by being loyal to a fault, Putin created a plan that had no basis in reality. For example, the primary invasion thrust south from Belarus toward Kyiv brought only enough rations for the troops and fuel for their vehicles to last two to three days. The level to which Putin and his advisors were out of touch with reality was displayed by the troops who carried with them dress uniforms for their expected victory parade in the middle of the capital. Putin's invasion plan was filled with faulty assumptions, arbitrary political goals, and planning mistakes that ignored key Russian military principles. The initial invasion called for multiple unsupported lines of attack with no reserve forces 
tying the military to far-flung objectives that were unattainable for the modest size of its ground forces. Due to such isolation, Putin erroneously believed that his war plans were sound, that Ukraine would not put up much resistance, and that US and NATO support would not be strong enough or arrive fast enough to make a difference. The invasion plan reinforced in Putin's mind by his sycophantic comrades painted a picture of the valiant Russian army riding unchallenged into the territory of Ukraine. The brotherly Ukrainians would welcome them with open arms and would thank them for rescuing all of Ukraine from their neo-Nazi and corrupt drug-addicted leadership. The overmatched Ukrainian forces would run at the first sight of overwhelming Russian forces. After Kyiv fell within three days, the liberators would then receive a warm greeting in the southern and eastern regions of the country. The Russian elder brothers would then install a properly subservient government in Kyiv that would gratefully accommodate any demands Putin placed upon them. It came as quite a shock then, when Russia's troops, which along with its direct leadership had no inkling that they were going to be an invading army, and ran headlong into a fierce and unified Ukrainian resistance, supported by unexpected amounts of advanced Western weaponry and accurate satellite-supported intelligence. The three-pronged invasion suffered far more casualties than they either expected or could cope with. According to Russian doctrine, any major-level war, such as the Ukraine invasion, should have begun with weeks of air and missile attacks targeting an enemy's military installations and critical infrastructure. Russia's planners consider this the decisive period of warfare, with air force operations and missile strikes lasting between four and six weeks, designed to erode the opposing country's military capabilities and capacity to resist. According to Russia's military doctrine, ground forces are typically deployed to secure objectives only after massive artillery bombardments combined with air force and missile assaults have weakened or destroyed most of the opposition. But Putin's delusions aren't the only issue in the Ukraine war. When you have a leader who's lost touch with reality, and a whole crowd of people cheering all hail the emperor's new clothes, your kingdom is pretty much doomed. General George S. Patton used to say, if everybody is thinking alike then somebody isn't thinking. Patton was always keenly aware that yes men, those who only tell their bosses what the boss wants to hear, aren't helpful at all, but only reinforce what the boss is already thinking. In 2022, one of Putin's most significant intelligence figures defected to the West carrying with him a trove of important information about Putin the man, detailing his habits, his fears, and his reluctance to use any cell phones. Gleb Karakulov, who served in the Federal Protection Service FSO, a quasi-military force tasked with protecting those officials closest to Putin, described Putin as a president who has lost touch with the world. Putin has been living in an information cocoon for the past couple of years, spending most of his time in his residences, which the media very fittingly calls bunkers. He is pathologically afraid for his life, he surrounds himself with an impenetrable barrier of quarantines and an information vacuum, he only values his own life and the lives of his family and friends. Karakulov also shed light on Putin's inner circle. Putin requires all staff working in the same room as him and anyone who will appear close to him in photo ops to undergo a two-week quarantine, which severely limits the number of people who have personal access to him. Karakulov confirmed that Putin relies heavily for information on reports provided by the chiefs of his security services. Putin does not use a cell phone or the internet and does not even bring an internet specialist with him when he travels abroad. He only receives information from his closest circle, which means that he lives in an information vacuum, Karakulov said. Ok, so we've established Putin is pretty much running his own operation into the ground. But this isn't the only reason Russia is failing in the Russo-Ukraine war. Let's talk about Russia's abysmal logistics for a second. The famous quote, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics, has been credited to everyone from Napoleon to US General Omar Bradley. But the first recorded use of that phrase in that form was by a retired four-star Marine general named Robert Hilliard Barrow. He was speaking about the difference between localized maneuvers that could win a battle and overall army supply coordination that could win or lose a war. Russia's invasion of Ukraine was plagued by logistical nightmares from the very beginning. Ukraine knew they could depend on their home-designed Skiff or Stuna P anti-tank guided missile ATGM systems, but they also knew they'd be facing 2,000 or more Russian main battle tanks, plus more than twice that number of armored infantry fighting vehicles IFVs. Knowing that Ukraine needed help against these armored forces, the US and its allies managed to deliver more than 17,000 anti-tank missile systems to Ukraine within the first month of the war. 
including the Anglo-Swedish short-range Enlaw rocket and the even more powerful US-made Javelin ATGM. Ukraine was also supplied with Bayraktar TB2 drones from Turkey. Ukraine used these weapon systems not just against Russia's armored forces, but also against even more valuable targets, their fuel and ammunition vehicles. Without resupplies of ammunition, their tanks and even their infantry had to resort to more limited attacks, and without fuel, some of their armored columns ground to a halt completely. Most famous, the 40-mile-long armored column that struck south from Belarus toward Kyiv in the opening days of the war was stalled due to a combination of stiff Ukrainian resistance, primarily ambushes from either side of the narrow penetration, combined with successful targeting of Russia's ammo and fuel trucks by both anti-tank missiles and targeted drone attacks. Military analysts who have analyzed the early months of the war have come to the conclusion that Russia completely botched its initial invasion for a variety of reasons and that its campaign has been riddled with miscalculations, poor communication, and widespread confusion. Former CIA military analyst Jeffrey Edmonds, who is also a Russia expert at the Center for Naval Analyses, says in a recent interview, We would have thought that they would have done a much more deliberate, well-thought-through operation. That is not what they did. Russian warfare usually involved masses of artillery pounding enemy locations, followed by massed armor and mechanized infantry assaults, combined with air support and helicopter attacks. Instead of leading with a substantial air and artillery campaign and gaining strategic superiority over Ukraine, Russian commanders apparently instructed their troops to just drive to Kyiv. The units quickly faced unexpected ambushes, repeated tactical surprise, and a logistic supply train that had not anticipated anything beyond a half-week offensive. The 40-mile traffic jam north of Kyiv underscored another recurring problem with Russian logistics. They are dependent on rail lines to move troops and support gear around their own country, but cannot link those rail lines up with their offensive advances into Ukraine. That leaves a gap between Russia's end-of-the-line ammo and fuel dumps and the Ukrainian front lines. One solution Russian commanders used to reduce that gap, and the length of time it would take to resupply forward units, was placing their supply dumps closer to the front lines. That decision turned disastrous when the US began providing Ukraine with better artillery systems, including the M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, or HIMARS, with its pinpoint accuracy out to 50 miles, twice the range of the M777 howitzer Ukraine had previously been using with its 25-mile range. But Russian commanders failed to respect the accuracy and range of HIMARS systems and continually lost weapon storage depots over and over again. Too often, Russia placed their ammunition in the same building as their troops or close by to such a location. That proved disastrous on at least one occasion, when Ukraine struck an occupied school building in Makiivka in the Donetsk region on New Year's Eve, killing as many as 400 Russian soldiers and wounding another 300, according to Ukraine claims. Another persistent problem in Russia's logistics fiasco has been the reliance on unsecured phone lines. This has allowed Ukrainian intelligence to triangulate their position and strike them with highly accurate artillery and missile strikes. One such attack reportedly left hundreds of Russian soldiers dead and prompted the Russian Ministry of Defense to announce it is already clear that the main reason of what took place included the massive use, contrary to the ban, of personal mobile phones in the range of enemy weapons. Yet such use persists, both from the average trooper to the high command. The Russian news agency TASS suggested that the New Year's Eve attack was also due to soldiers' misuse of civilian cell phones. Preliminarily, the reason for the strike was the active use of mobile phones by the newly arrived military personnel. The enemy revealed the activity of cellular communications and the location of the subscribers, which allowed them to target the temporary barracks. And then there's Russia's mass misjudgment of NATO's united front. Putin and his tiny handful of advisors also miscalculated the stiffness of NATO's resolve to defend Ukraine, as well as their willingness to arm them with every weapon system they could. Putin believed the individual countries of NATO, led by the US, Germany, France, Great Britain, and Poland, would each go their separate ways and would fail to provide a united front against what Putin expected would be a short blitzkrieg-type war. Instead, his brutal invasion solidified NATO's unity and even helped convince new countries like Finland and Sweden to ask for membership. Finland's admission, making NATO's 31st member, was an especially bitter pill to swallow, as it increased NATO's border presence with Russia by an extra 830 miles. This was clearly one of Putin's most significant blunders. The US, NATO, and the European Union have remained relatively united 
in providing billions of military aid to Ukraine as well as considerable humanitarian assistance, while simultaneously applying sweeping sanctions against Russia. The sanctions have crippled the Russian economy, which took an extra hit from the loss of between 700,000 and 1 million young Russians who fled the country ahead of Putin's draft in the fall of 2022. The Russian population pyramid, already in an upside-down position with a declining birth rate and far more older citizens than young ones to replace them, is now teetering like a half-chopped-down tree ready to collapse at any moment. Now let's get into the truly ridiculous part of our analysis of Putin's failures as a war commander, fighting a modern war using World War I tactics. By the end of the first year of the war, it became clear that in addition to all the strategic and leadership mistakes Putin and Russia have committed, there's a vast difference in how the two armies are fighting it out on the ground. While Ukraine has relied heavily on smart weapons, surveillance and attack drones, ATGMs, man pads, precision guided munitions, even drone attack boats in the Black Sea, Russia has settled on the World War I tactic of massed artillery, followed by human waves of soldiers, often without even the benefit of a few tanks sprinkled in here and there for support. Such tactics may have worked in World War I or even the latter stages of World War II, when the former Soviet Union had more than a million men under arms and was facing a severely weakened German army that had bled white from four years of continuous warfare. But Ukraine has learned to adapt and overcome, and has used its precision artillery systems, especially the High Mars artillery, to telling effect. Meanwhile, Russia has used their huge surplus of artillery to flatten cities like Bakhmut, Mariinka, and Mariupol. But the massed infantry assaults that followed leveled a horrific toll on the attackers. Estimates are that in addition to losing more than half of their pre-war stockpile of main battle tanks, Russia has lost more than 200,000 soldiers killed, wounded, or captured. Their losses in the 10-month effort to take Bakhmut have been so enormous that the Wagner private mercenary group that spearheaded the 10-month battle had to pull out of the line of combat to refit, retrain, and regroup. Some estimates say that Wagner may have lost 90% of their 80,000-man full strength. Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, will only admit to having lost 20,000 men, which is still a staggeringly high number of casualties for a city that has no inherent strategic value. While we're on the subject of losses, let's talk about the real crime and tragedy of this war. Because of the sanctions limiting Russia's access to computer chips and other resources for their high-tech industries, Russia has been unable to replace many of their advanced weapons, such as their precision munitions and state-of-the-art missiles. That's why analysts are stunned to see Putin wasting so much of its stockpiles of precision munitions on striking civilian targets. Military experts and government officials have said that Putin's terror campaign against the Ukrainian population was not a sustainable use of Russia's limited stockpiles and was unlikely to negatively affect Ukraine's will to fight. In fact, just the opposite has happened. Continued explosions in civilian areas across Ukraine, not just the capital of Kyiv, have hardened the average Ukrainian's resolve to see this fight through until every Russian soldier has been pushed out of their country. More recently, senior U.S. intelligence officials have said Russia is burning through its munitions faster than it can replace them. Officials also say the use of massive amounts of artillery and precision-guided munitions has forced Moscow to turn to Iran and North Korea for supplies. Retired U.S. Army General David Petraeus summed up just a few of the mistakes Putin has made during his invasion of Ukraine when he said, They completely underestimated the Ukrainian forces and completely overestimated the Russian forces and they could not impose their line of conducting a military campaign and prepare forces for conducting this campaign. In addition, they did not have modern telecommunication systems, he said, referring to their use of civilian cell phones. Therefore, the generals continued to die, commanding an army from within an intelligence vacuum, relying on sycophants and toadies rather than experts and veterans. An army sent to war without proper planning, hamstrung by poor logistics, and saddled with rampant thievery underestimating your opponent's will to fight, misjudging NATO's united front, squandering sophisticated precision weapons on a campaign to try to break the will of a large civilian population, youth movement to leave the country, possibly for good, an economy that has been wrecked by sanctions that continue to penalize the ones who are still left day after day. It seems like Putin not only did not follow Sun Tzu's dictum to win your battles by making no mistakes, it seems like he's made practically every mistake in the book. But what do you think? What is Putin's greatest mistake in the war in Ukraine? 
Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. As if losing tanks by the dozens and terrified conscripts by the hundreds on a daily level wasn't bad enough, Putin has now been betrayed by one of his own. And you won't believe this guy's getaway story and what he revealed about the maniacal Russian dictator. Here's the thing, when you're fighting a war, information is everything. The more you know, the more effective you'll be on the battlefield. And if you're looking for an edge over your enemy, the best intelligence often comes from the source you least expect. One such example hit global newsrooms just recently when a high-ranking defector from Vladimir Putin's inner circle decided enough was enough and escaped to the West. How did he do it? Why did he do it? And most importantly, what did he reveal about Putin the leader and the state of his forces in Ukraine? Join us today and find out. In mid-October 2022, Gleb Karakulov, a member of Putin's elite personal security service, concocted a daring plan. A graduate of Russia's Mozhaisky Military Space Academy, he had risen through the ranks of Russia's Federal Guard Service, becoming a captain and engineer in the Presidential Communications Directorate. Impressive technical skills rewarded Gleb with important jobs. Among them, he became responsible for arranging and providing secure encrypted communications to and from Putin's presidential and the Prime Minister's office on their foreign visits. This role exposed Gleb to a flood of classified information, as well as the routine and private affairs of Putin's inner circle. Let's put it this way, Gleb found himself smack in the middle of Information Central, and it was a prestigious, important job, but one that soon began to grate against his moral compass. For Gleb, the February 2022 invasion changed everything. By late 2022, Putin's ruthless tactics, Russia's changing fortunes, and the criminality demonstrated by average Russian soldiers in their deployments to Ukraine caused many Russians to begin quietly opposing the war. Gleb himself never participated specifically in Russia's military activities, but racked by internal guilt and aware he was implicitly supporting an authoritarian regime bent on executing its leaders' criminal orders, he found himself among this group disillusioned by the brainwashing propaganda and hypocrisy at every level of society. What this guy did next took no small amount of courage. Just two years from retirement from the FSB, Gleb made a monumental decision. He decided he wanted out. I could no longer make compromises with myself, he later told interviewers. I couldn't remain in the service of this president. I consider him a war criminal. Even though I am not directly involved in this war, it's no longer possible for me to carry out his criminal orders or stay in his service. It wasn't only Putin's behavior that put Gleb off. During his travels in the initial phases of the war, Gleb noted how casually his FGS colleagues talked about the bloodshed and devastation Russian soldiers were inflicting on Ukraine. According to Gleb, they would savor every detail of what was happening in the war, even taking pleasure in these discussions. I can't describe how disgusting and unpleasant it was, he continued. I don't know, I had this feeling of total disgust. I decided to quit. We get it, Gleb, and we're with you on this. His decision coincided with Putin's September mobilization order that raised a new wave of Russian conscripts for frontline service in Ukraine. This posed a major problem for Gleb. He could terminate his contract, but if he left the service he knew under the mobilization he would immediately become a reserve officer, consigned to the front after his discharge. He would not be party to a criminal war, on or behind the front lines. It was as simple as that. So with his decision made, what would he do next? The problem was picking the right moment. Gleb had an incredibly important job. Every time the Russian president or prime minister traveled anywhere, he would go ahead as the leader of an advanced team, with enough specialized communications equipment to fill a Kamaz truck. Over 13 years, Gleb made more than 180 trips, each ensuring Russia's political elite could safely communicate with their colleagues from anywhere in the world. Because of his routine travels, he decided the best time to escape would be when he was far from the Russian metropole, at least far enough to be near somewhere with an airport that could get him into a pro-Western country. But he had to pace himself. Timing was everything. In October 2022, the opportunity finally presented itself. Here's how he pulled it off, and it's genius. Russian heads of state were scheduled to fly to Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan, to attend a regional diplomatic summit. Naturally, Gleb went ahead, 
to ensure Putin and his staff's communications were securely installed. It was there, however, where Gleb hatched his wily plan. On the final day of his business trip, he told his colleagues he wanted to go souvenir shopping after his shift. While there, he prepared the next phase of his plan, the getaway itself. When colleagues began texting him asking where he was shopping so they could meet up with him, he told them he had developed stomach cramps and needed to rest in his hotel room. Little did they know, Gleb was already on his way. That afternoon, he picked up his wife and daughter, who had come to Astana under the pretense of visiting Gleb, took a taxi to the airport, and prepared to board a flight to Istanbul, Turkey. Gleb must have been feeling the pressure at this point. His colleagues would soon become suspicious. The minutes ticked by. The passengers prepared to board. And then, an unexpected announcement made Gleb's heart sink. The flight was briefly delayed. He had to act quickly. Knowing his colleagues would be looking for him, Gleb turned off his phone. There was no turning back now. An hour later, he boarded the plane with his family. Relief swept over him and his wife as the flight attendants sealed the door. He had made it, but he was now a wanted man. Gleb Karakulov's escape officially made him the highest-ranking intelligence officer in Russia's recent past to defect to the West. By the time he landed, his phone had been bombarded with messages asking him where he was and what he was doing. Others who had caught on labeled him a traitor. His FGS operations department officer tried to get in touch. Gleb never responded. In Istanbul, Gleb and his family were met by Katya Hakim, a member of the Dossier Center, a London-based group funded by Russian opposition figure Mikhail Khodorovsky. The Dossier Center transported Gleb to a secure flat in an undisclosed location and began to meet with him in person. He agreed to give an exclusive interview before going public. Gleb was clear on his rationale for giving such a high-profile interview so soon after his escape. Russia's illegal invasion and occupation of Ukraine has thus far divided Russian officials, politicians, and elites, but until now, few have had the courage or audacity to publicly condemn Putin's actions. Gleb told his interviewers he wanted to speak out to express his opposition to the war in Ukraine. Above all, he wanted to tell his Federal Guard colleagues and all Russian citizens to do something that they should not believe the war has anything to do with Ukrainian aggression. So what did Gleb say? Ironically, the biggest and most oft-repeated observation from the interview came as the least surprising. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, Putin's paranoia has gone into overdrive. Putin is pathologically afraid for his life. He spends most of his time at his residences, reinforced safe houses the media has aptly labeled bunkers. This is hardly shocking, self-preservation is priority number one in every dictator's handbook, but Putin seems to take it to another level, leading an isolated, cocooned existence cut off from reality. Putin does not use a mobile phone, at least Gleb had never once seen him with one in all his years of service. And why would he? Mobile phones can be hacked, bugged, or compromised, an unnecessary security risk for heads of state. Gleb said that contrary to Putin, Whenever the Russian Prime Minister goes on business trips, a senior aide in charge of internet access will accompany them, using a laptop with secure access to look things up as necessary. Putin requires nothing of the sort. What's the point of the internet for Putin, Gleb remarked. He only receives information from his closest circle, which means that he lives in an information vacuum. This is worth exploring more. In his self-incurred isolation, the Russian president essentially gets his information from three sources. One, his inner circle. Yes, men who tell him everything he wants to hear. 2. Authorized reports from his military intelligence and security services. And 3. Yes, you guessed it, Russian propaganda. Putin insists on having a Russian TV everywhere he goes, and this is significant. He loves watching his own sensationalized propaganda espoused by raging pundits who exaggerate the nobility of Putin's war and minimize its global repercussions. We all know someone like this. People who spend so much time in their own echo chambers, they become convinced they are the only ones who can see the world as it really is. The irony is that the more they feed themselves information from one side, the more unbalanced their perspective becomes. Putin takes this to the extreme. We shouldn't be surprised, but it has been said that many of the reports he reads from his intelligence services are extremely flawed. Allegedly, an FGS report issued before the war claimed the Ukrainian people would greet Russian troops as liberators. Something we now know turned out to be completely false, but this report was apparently a key factor in Putin's decision to invade to begin with, a misguided venture that has resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, with no end in sight. Putin's paranoia manifests itself in other ways too, 
According to Gleb, Putin is so self-isolating he continues to observe strict quarantine procedures, interweaving peak pandemic COVID precautions into his own personal security routine. We have to observe strict quarantine for two weeks before any event, even those lasting 15 to 20 minutes, Gleb said. There is a pool of employees who have been cleared, who underwent two-week quarantine. They are considered clean and can work in the same room as Putin. When asked whether the staff questioned these measures, Gleb responded that everyone was a little perplexed as to why this is still going on, because everyone has been forced to get vaccinated. Everyone undergoes health screenings, monitors their health, and takes regular tests. I know that all of the president's aides take PCR tests several times a day. I have no idea why, he's probably just worried about his health. Perhaps Putin isn't wrong to be overly cautious, with millions of people who would gladly take his life. Given the chance, there may be a method to his madness. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Putin's paranoia manifests itself not only in his behavior and his relationships, but in the places he occupies and the vehicles that move him from one place to the next. Having had to install encrypted communications on a range of non-stationary facilities ranging from planes, helicopters, trains and yachts, Gleb noted that Putin has contingency plans in place for almost every conceivable situation. One of Putin's preferred modes of transport of late is a specialized armored train, which Gleb noted appeared on his FGS schedule sometime between 2014 and 2015. The train is unremarkable at first glance, bearing the same appearance as an ordinary train, the same as all the other Russian railway trains, he said, gray with a red stripe. The front of Putin's train is what distinguishes it from any other. Its two engine cars constitute the main armored element, bulkier and beefier than traditional engines. These contain encrypted communication systems and armored plating. Putin frequently uses the train for travel, but it enables him to hide in plain sight. Planes show up on certain services and networks, whereas a train, how many of these gray trains are there? Most importantly, they cannot be tracked on any information resource. It's done for stealth purposes. Between August and September 2021, Putin began using his train far more regularly. The FGS guards had to be quarantined for two weeks prior to any journey. Putin's background as a KGB agent certainly informs his paranoia playbook. For example, he has a unique way of staving off eavesdroppers and bugs when he travels abroad. He takes a soundproof telephone booth with him everywhere he goes, ensuring he can speak with complete confidentiality. When asked about the booth, Gleb said it is bulky. It's a cube about 2.5 meters high. Inside there is a workstation and a telephone, which one can use to talk without fear of those conversations being overheard or read by foreign intelligence. On top of this, like any head of state, Putin has contingency plans in place in case an attempt is made on his life. Gleb said that on a visit to Kazakhstan, he and his team rigged up a communications array in a bunker under the Russian embassy as an added precaution. It's a kind of paranoia. You are on another state's soil, Gleb observed, questioning Putin's motives. The state is the summit's convener, providing all the security. The embassy territory itself is also guarded, another precaution to ensure the president can be whisked to a safe location in a flash. Were a nuclear exchange ever to take place, Putin would likely take shelter in his airborne bunker, a modified four-engined Ilyushin Il-86 jetliner known as the Flying Kremlin, or more colloquially, Putin's doomsday plane. The aircraft was designed during the Cold War to protect Russian leadership in a worst-case scenario. With in-air refueling capabilities, no external windows save those in the cockpit, and a modified radome, with a special communications array protruding from its fuselage, Putin's secure aerial command post is designed to withstand extreme weather and electromagnetic and nuclear blasts. The United States also has a four-plane fleet of similar aircraft, most notably, a modified Boeing 747 known as the E-4B Nightwatch, kept fueled and ready for any situation. One of the most interesting observations was how Putin likes to make it look like he is more active than he really is. Ever since the war began, the Russian president has spent more and more time locked away in his secure residences in St. Petersburg, Sochi, or Novgorod. Interestingly, each of his offices in these locations is designed to be identical, so that Putin can appear to be in one place but really work from another. There were times when I know he was in Sochi. The TV is on in the background, the news is on, and they show him conducting a meeting in Novo Agariovo. So I asked a colleague in Sochi, has he left already? 
No, he says, he's still here. The guy used to joke that when Putin was in Sochi, they would deliberately pretend that he was leaving. They would bring a plane, a motorcade would set off, while in actual fact, he would stay in Sochi. I mean, the guys would talk about it, almost laughing. This is a ruse to confuse foreign intelligence in the first place, and secondly, to prevent any attempts on his life. Speaking of Putin being active or not, with all the rumors about his health decreasing over the past few years, you may be wondering about his physical shape. Here's the scoop. One of the informant's most surprising revelations has to do with Putin's physical fitness. Many have long suspected that Putin has been in bad shape. Videos showing the Russian president's unnatural arm and leg twitching and alarming facial expressions fuel the fire of speculation. Some believe he has early-onset Parkinson's disease. Others posit it as blood cancer, but Gleb cast doubts on these claims. I can tell you that I went on many business trips with him, and he went on many trips before 2020. After that, he stayed in his bunker and maybe made just one, maximum three, business trips a year. Given the fact that there have been many business trips, only one or two were cancelled because of his health. When asked to clarify, Gleb added that over a span of 13 years since 2009, just two back-to-back -back business trips were cancelled owing to illness. He is in better health than many other people of his age, he said, citing his annual medical checkups. Vladimir Putin is probably not going to die anytime soon, a dossier center analyst told a CNN reporter. Gleb spoke to Putin's work ethic. He is a hard worker, sometimes working until 2 or 3 a.m. on business trips and holding meetings abroad in the middle of the night to coincide with daytime hours in Moscow. Okay, so far we've learned a lot about the Russian dictator and his creepy little habits. So what does this lunatic actually have planned for Ukraine? Gleb confessed that while he believed Putin would do something in Ukraine, he never believed it would evolve into a full-scale war. To him, something happened. The energetic and active former head of the FSB and prime minister turned president, once involved in global affairs, suddenly shut himself off from the world in 2020, erecting all kinds of barriers, the quarantine, the information vacuum, his reality became distorted. A sane person in the 21st century who looks objectively at everything happening in the world, let alone who can predict developments, at least in the medium term, would not have allowed this war to happen, Gleb claims. His dismay that nearly all of his FGS colleagues maintained unwavering support for Putin as the war escalated is palpable in his interview. To him, average Russians will struggle to separate fact from fiction as long as they stay glued to their Russian state TVs. His own wife, he said, would never have understood how information was distorted had he not told her how different things were in reality. I don't want to think about it, but if I hadn't been an officer in the FGS, I'm horrified to admit that I might have been a Z patriot or whatever they're called, because I'd be watching TV. The excessive spending to preserve one man's lavish lifestyle private luxury getaways for oligarchs and friends of Putin's, the chronic misuse of Russian taxpayer money, it all started to get to Gleb. He devoted the final part of his exclusive interview to his FGS colleagues. He exhorted them to recognize their privileged position, to see things as they really were and speak out against Putin's war. How many nameless victims of this war are there? How many of them are children? How many more such victims are required before you stop putting up with it? What is happening now in Ukraine, all this destruction, this war of aggression, terrorism, and genocide of all Ukrainian people, all this is a criminal offense. Our president has become a war criminal. You have to stop following these criminal orders. But the most important motive for him remains his family. I consider it my goal that my child does not know these horrors of war, so that the state, which interferes in every possible way in the upbringing of children, does not touch her, so that she can grow up in a calm environment and will be able to grow up as a person and realize herself. It is a dignified, noble, and honorable cause. We hope that in time, Gleb's decision to defect will be vindicated in Ukraine's assured sovereignty and the end of Putin's war as we know it. But what do you think? Will Putin's madness eventually cause him to self-destruct, or will it continue to aid him in his maniacal conquering plans? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Wars cost money. Every bullet fired, every building bombed, every intercepted missile, each of these actions comes with a hefty price tag. But how exactly do you calculate the financial burden of war, say, on a daily level? To put it bluntly, it ain't easy. But our military experts are here to break it down for you. Today, we are diving into the jaw-dropping daily cost of the ongoing war in Ukraine. So sit down, grab your ledger books, and buckle in. 
Oh, and spoiler alert, this may shock you. Of course, we lead with the necessary disclaimer. It is impossible to know the exact cost of a war on this scale, or any scale, in terms of blood and treasure. You and I both know that as war itself unfolds under its own fog in real time, the precise number of shells fired, soldiers killed, buildings destroyed, or, for example, the true acreage of agricultural yields lost to hidden mines, unexploded cluster bombs, remnants of rockets and shellfire riddling the countryside remains obscure. Sometimes historical clarity never comes. Decades after the cataclysmic global conflicts which defined the 20th century, historians, economists and analysts continue to debate the scale of the destruction, the true human cost, and the financial ramifications of World Wars I and II. For those of us watching a conflict from afar which hasn't even ended yet, the task is not an easy one. The financial effects of this war will reverberate in ways we can't even comprehend for decades to come. Suffice it to say that from public international sources which we have been able to consult, it should come as no surprise that though the cost is astronomical, it is by no means a perfect representation. In war as in peace, nearly everything costs something. To show how we've tried to enumerate the daily cost of the war today, Let's start with a thought experiment. Try to imagine an average day in Ukraine. At the time of writing, Ukrainian forces are waist-deep into their summer counteroffensive, attempting to penetrate Russia's defensive fortifications from the southern to the northeastern tip of Ukraine. On any given day, you have small firefights and larger, supporting probing maneuvers within distinct pockets across Ukraine's 1,000-kilometer front line with Russia, and big or small battles are expensive. Soldiers paid a daily wage carry hundreds of bullets and dozens of grenades with them into battle, clearing garbage-strewn Russian trenches of their occupiers as dozens, hundreds, even thousands of artillery shells are fired by each side in support. Drones, some of them expensive military makes, but the vast majority inexpensive commercial offerings, linger overhead to provide reconnaissance, direct added firepower, and fire support. The price of the soldiers' wages, the ammunition expenditures, and the drones alone required to wage the ongoing counteroffensive must be staggering, but that barely scratches the surface. Tanks and vehicles factor in too. Both sides employ a vast array of armored vehicles, tanks, artillery, rocket systems, personnel carriers, and civilian vehicles at any given moment, some donated by external countries, some furnished by Russia and Ukraine themselves. Each of these has a paid crew tasked with operating them, when they are damaged or destroyed, each side attempts to salvage what they can. Fixing vehicles requires additional mechanics, tools, and spare parts, which add up. As you zoom out, the expenses multiply. Soldier welfare is a major cost as both sides employ them by the hundreds of thousands. They need money, food, clothing, and equipment to subsist in the field, and medical services if wounded. Getting a wounded soldier to the rear hospital means you must factor in the cost of the ambulance employed, the fuel expended, as well as the cost of the medical equipment, the medical staffs, and the medevac itself. They are taken to hospitals which may run on skeleton staffs, but whose own infrastructure commands its own financial attention. In death, both sides must keep morgues running, pay family stipends and funeral costs, and we're still only beginning. Soon, the civilian sphere comes into the picture, and here, the war's destruction has been arguably far more devastating than on the front lines. The World Bank estimates that Ukraine has incurred $400 billion worth of destruction in collateral damage. Epitomized by the waves of cruise missiles and random criminal attacks on civilians, which regularly rain down on Kyiv. Reconstructing damaged apartment blocks, water mains, sewage lines, power grids, and if you happen to be in Bakhmut or similarly devastated places, literally entire cities. And you start to see the scales involved. Harder still to contemplate is the relative economic consequences of the war's refugee crisis. An estimated 8 million Ukrainians and hundreds of thousands of Russians have fled their respective homes, some by force, others by choice. Within Ukraine, another 5 million are internally displaced. The towering economic cost of not just providing transport, food and accommodation for these people, but also the relative shock to the domestic economic system by their absence and long-term effects of the brain drain may cripple both nations' financial outlooks for decades to come. Then you wonder what it might take to rebuild things like the Kakovka Dam in southern Ukraine, whose floodwaters devastated towns and villages downstream. Oh, and we still have the robust coalition of Western and other nation-states donating weapons, military equipment, 
and aid by the hundreds of billions every year. Many of these countries rationalize this as a small price to pay to have Ukraine virtually dismantle Russia's once vaunted arsenal. And yes, Putin is burning through soldiers, planes, helicopters, missiles, tanks, political capital and other military resources at an alarming rate. But it all begs the question, is it sustainable? Can Putin continue building new fortifications in and around Ukraine as the counteroffensive unfolds? Can he sustain the cost of massive warships sunk, the careless hemorrhaging of Russian conscript forces thrown into the meat grinder willy-nilly, the omnipresent pressure on the Russian economy imposed by Western sanctions? Some analysts have estimated that Russia, increasingly cut off from a huge chunk of the global economy and left with many of its goods unsold, has already lost a trillion dollars on the war thus far. One thing is certain, if Putin doesn't give the order to cut his losses, the bleeding will not stop anytime soon. The long-term economic ramifications could be seismically bad for Russia. That said, let's get down to brass tacks. Let's begin by factoring in some averages for Russia alone. Over a nine-month span, it was estimated that Russia expended anywhere between 10,000 and 50,000 artillery shells a day. We know the average cost of a Soviet-caliber artillery shell is about $1,000, so that means that Russian artillery costs hover at upwards of $50 million a day. Multiply that out over a 16-month span and you easily have tens of billions of dollars spent by Russia on artillery shells alone. Estimates put Russia's missile expenditures over that same 9-month span at $12 billion, with each one costing a cool $3 million. What's more, Russia has lost almost 300 combat aircraft, with those coming in around $18 million apiece and 261 helicopters, each costing on average $10.4 million. Total aviation losses over nine months, somewhere in the region of $8 billion. We all know the dismal combat record of Russia's tank crews, and how a cheap $100 Chinese drone using a 3D printed release mechanism can drop a single anti-tank munition and knock out a vehicle worth tens of millions of dollars. Well, we should go through Russian vehicle losses just to get a taste of what this war has cost Putin and his people. To date, Russia has lost 2,114 tanks. If a T-64 costs $1.1 million, a T-72 costs $1.2 million, and a T-80 costs about $3 million, a T-90 will set you back $4.5 million. The confirmed cost of losing these models destroyed, abandoned, or captured alone would be as follows. 56 T-4s, $61.6 million, 1,112 T-72s, $1.33 billion, 537 T-80s, $1.61 billion, 68 T-90s, $306 million. That is a cool $3.3 billion on tanks alone. Then you have to add in the cost Russia has incurred trying to repair and maintain its aging tank fleet in the field, as well as the costs of every single truck, armored vehicle, and personnel carrier confirmed destroyed in Ukraine, and experts say that Russia has lost about $20 billion worth of vehicles. It seems relatively cheap to keep an average Russian soldier on the battlefield in Ukraine. On average, after all, it costs the Kremlin just around $200 per month for each soldier. But we also know that last September 2022, Russia mobilized 300,000 new conscripts, on top of several hundred thousand forces already in the field. It was reported in January of 2023 that Putin authorized another mobilization of some 500,000 soldiers. Since it is unclear when these forces will make their way onto the battlefield, let's simplify things a bit. How much would it be to keep just 300,000 conscripts on the battlefield over a nine-month span? 300,000 soldiers pay $200 a day for nine months amounts to $16.44 billion. Stretch that out to another seven months, the current length of the conflict, and the increasing number of mobilized soldiers and we can safely estimate that the bill will come in somewhere in the region of $30 billion. Die in battle and the costs continue to mount. Reports indicate that Russia pays the families of deceased soldiers a death compensation of 7.4 million rubles, or $110,000 per soldier. There's no clear indication of just how many Russian soldiers have actually died in Ukraine, but we know the number is incredibly steep. On the conservative side, there are some indications that around 40,000 Russians have died thus far. If this is the case, then the Russian government has shelled out around $4.4 billion to the bereaved loved ones of its fallen dead. What of the Russian casualties, at least those that make it to the aid stations and aren't brutally left behind by their comrades, 
What does it cost for their treatment? In war, it is generally a safe estimate that for every death, there will be around three times that number wounded or missing. That's over 100,000 men, which would be another five to $10 billion to treat. It's tough to say exactly, but for those who have sat down and honestly tried to crunch the numbers, experts estimate that Russia's venture in Ukraine is costing $10 billion per month, for a total cost of $160 billion over the past 16 months. Mobilization has wreaked havoc on Russia's domestic economy. Some say that the country is in the midst of a massive brain drain, having lost a million of its best and brightest workers over the last year alone, many of whom fled the country outright. To replace these educated and skilled laborers, you have to find replacements and train them, a very costly thing to do. In most cases, Russia can't afford to even do that, and has had to vastly scale back, even shut down many of its firms. That tends to happen when you mobilize hundreds of thousands of men all of a sudden without a graduated plan to compensate for their absence in the domestic sphere. Russian industrial production has contracted 5% over the last month. One former advisor at Russia's central bank recently told NPR that as Western sanctions continue to freeze Russia's economy, it has increasingly attempted to take over foreign assets within its borders to compensate for its financial and industrial losses. It is a sign that despite what Russia is telling the world, its long-term economic health is not as resilient as it may seem. If you're a Russian billionaire or oligarch, the war has not been as profitable as others may have been in the past. It is estimated that the Russian upper crust has lost around $93 billion worth of assets in 2022 alone. Normal Russians are becoming more and more frugal, saving their money for when times get even leaner. What this means is that Russian commercial markets are on the verge of long-term stagnation. Goods imports are down 20% from 2021. Technology imports have decreased by 30%. Car production is down by 67%. Russian arms exports, once a crown jewel in the Russian economy, have slumped. Even if Russian GDP hovers around the estimated $2 trillion, a figure the IMF endorses, it is spending a lot on fighting. How much military spending, you ask? Well, in 2020, the so-labeled second most powerful nation in the world spent $61 billion on its military, a not insignificant sum when you think about how much it had to maintain. Well, that figure jumped sixfold in 2022, with Russia spending $346 billion to try and re-inject life into its stillborn invasion. Russia has been paying for this war entirely from its own pockets, unlike Ukraine, and it will be feeling that down the road. But figures revealing the true cost for Russia are often at variance with one another. Take, for example, a recent Special Operations Forces report, which alleged that the war was not costing Russia $10 billion a month, as we tallied earlier, but an even steeper $900 million per day. Breaking it down even more, we'd see Russia shouldering military expenditures of around $27 billion a month, or $432 billion for the 16 months that have passed. These might be ballpark figures, but it might be closer to reality than we think. The country's economy has been fractured, its military potential is severely crippled. How long can Russia sustain these losses? Over a two-day span during Ukraine's counteroffensive last month, Russia was said to have lost 48 artillery platforms, two fighter jets, and two helicopters. One of the fighters was a Sukhoi Su-34, which costs anywhere from $40 to $50 million. The other, an Su-35, which costs from $40 to $65 million, hundreds of millions of dollars lost in the time it would take for you to travel from one side of the world to the other. Putin has to hope the Russian bear has deeper pockets for the hard fight ahead. Ukraine is facing an equally grim financial future, if not far more so. Yes, it has been supported at every step by incredibly generous donations from countries around the globe, but with its cities, fields, and forests acting as the war's primary theater, Material destruction has rained down on Ukraine on par with some of the largest wars in history. Last year, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky estimated that not counting reconstruction costs, it took around $5 billion per month to keep the war going. If Ukraine hopes to continue the war, Western donations will have to keep coming. That is, as long as Western governments can convince their populations it is in their interest to do so. Let's assess some of the numbers from January 2022 to January 2023. So far, more than 30 nations have funneled military equipment into the country. The US has donated the most military aid over that span, giving just under $50 billion, including the game-changing HIMARS rocket launcher systems, self-propelled artillery, 
M2 Bradley's and soon, M1 Abrams tanks, and the latest anti-tank weapons. This dwarfs the second-place donor, the United Kingdom, who has given $5.13 billion. After them, you have Poland, who has given $2.5 billion, Germany, $2.47 billion, Canada, $1.35 billion, and the Netherlands at $0.9 billion, and Italy, France, Norway, and Denmark, all just under a billion. Relative to a country's GDP, however, many smaller nations, especially those in the Baltic and in Eastern Europe, have been punching above their weight. While the US would rank 8th in terms of aid donated relative to GDP, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, and Lithuania have given more than their fair share. Among other things, Ukrainian troops are road-testing real-time online information and networking systems, drone-jamming guns, and maritime remote-controlled kamikaze boats, expensive Western systems that take real know-how and expertise to operate within a combined arms setting. They are improving their intelligence and surveillance-gathering efforts. They are becoming experts at psychological warfare, joint operations, and sustainment logistics. It's been a whirlwind crash course, to say the least. But they have not worked alone. As far back as 2014, Ukrainian officers were receiving Western training, especially from the United States, Great Britain, Canada, and other European nations. These programs, arguably more than the weapons and munitions themselves, are conferring Ukraine a distinct battlefield advantage. We aren't sure how much these training programs cost, but while they certainly aren't cheap when you factor in the salaries of the instructors, translators, and other observers, the munitions and vehicles utilized, the transport and accommodation for Ukrainian forces abroad, and the training programs being taught, they have undoubtedly proven their worth. Another dimension of aid doled out to Ukraine has not come from the governments, but from private corporations, charities, and multinational organizations. Companies from Elon Musk's SpaceX, which provided Ukraine with Starlink satellite internet use, to Amazon, which provided over $50 million in tech, logistics, and cybersecurity, to all the sleeping bags, cold weather gear, cooking equipment, field generators, first aid kits, clothing, and fuel units they might need in the field. Private citizens have shown how normal people, when working together, can achieve incredible things. Pooling together their resources, the citizens of European and other nations have donated hundreds of millions of dollars to the Ukrainian cause, with the Czech Republic, Taiwan, and South Korea alone donating $171 million, $33 million, and $3 million, respectively. Some countries, like neutral Austria, provided a half a million vaccine doses rather than money or military gear. Other countries, like Azerbaijan, helped deliver humanitarian aid to refugees. Taken together, all these costs add up to astronomical levels. From ammunition expenditure to destroyed vehicles and infrastructure, soldier and civilian hospitalization, humanitarian donations, and urban reconstruction, you are able to come to a reasonable estimate of what the war has cost thus far. The Kiel Institute for the World Economy in Germany, for example, said in February 2023 that aid from the world's nations added up to around $150 billion. In 10 months, Ukrainian officials tallied up 149,300 destroyed and damaged residential buildings, 131,400 private homes, 17,500 apartment buildings, and 280 dormitories, adding up to another $54 billion, or $5.4 billion per month, on average. If you add in the extra months, you get somewhere in the ballpark of around $80 billion, or $180 million each and every day, just to repair damaged housing. The infrastructure toll is also extensive. In early December 2022, Ukraine's Ministry of Development of Communities, Territories and Infrastructure said that in 10 months, Russia had destroyed 150 bridges and overpasses, amounting to $35 billion. Extend that for the remainder of the war, and you get more than $53.4 billion, or $118 million on bridges and overpasses alone per day. That doesn't touch on the 3,000 educational institutions struck by Russia, including 1,400 secondary schools, 865 preschools, and 505 institutions of higher education, costing $8.6 billion over 10 months, or an additional $28.67 million a day. The Kyiv School of Economics also said the 907 damaged cultural facilities, the 168 sports facilities, the 157 tourism facilities, and the 95 religious facilities would cost another $3.3 billion in 10 months, or $7 million a day. They chalked up more costs too – $6.6 billion for agriculture, $2.9 billion for transport, $2.4 billion for trade, 
2.3 billion for utilities, 2.2 billion for culture and sports tourism, 1.7 billion for healthcare, 6.6 billion for energy, 700 million for electronics, 300 million for social and financial setbacks, and 14 billion for ecological damages and you get $137.8 billion in damages over a 10-month span. Averaged out, that is over $206.7 billion in 15 months, or $458.33 million a day for Ukraine's domestic reconstruction alone. When you add Ukraine's $207.6 billion in cost to Russia's total of $405 billion, you get $612 billion combined, or $1.36 billion a day. But wait, there's more. Ukraine must also pay its 1 million soldiers, who receive more than double the monthly wages of their Russian counterparts, at 20,000 rivnias or $550 a month. Those in the heat of battle can make up to $2,700 a month with a frontline combatant bonus. Ukraine spent $31 billion on its military in 2022. It spends 15 million hryvnias to compensate a fallen soldier's family for his or her loss, over $400,000. So if 15,000 Ukrainian soldiers died, that would be an additional $20 billion in compensation. Ukraine's economic hit has been ruinous. Nearly half of its companies shut their doors in 2022. Its GDP was down 30% in 2022, losing an estimated $70 billion in revenue from the war alone. Ukraine will have to pay back tens of billions of dollars of loaned capital. There have been inflationary price hikes. Ukrainians are worried about not having food being able to heat their houses or light their rooms at night. This is all relatively easy to account for. But when you try to add up the war's silent toll, from the tangible costs of burying more than the estimated 9,083 Ukrainian civilians killed in the crossfire and settling their estates to the intangible cost of war-related distress stemming from the unnatural exposure to abuse, violence, and the unexpected loss of friends and family, and you are left with a mental health crisis whose effects will linger possibly for generations. How can you reasonably put a price tag on this? If the Ukrainian government is true in saying 60% of its soldiers have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, the knock-on effects will be akin to past wars, only worse. Alcohol abuse, suicide, depression, and anxiety tend to accompany PTSD diagnoses, and without adequate programs to treat them, Ukraine and Russia will both suffer not only from a massive, long-term economic hit, as individuals wrestle with the aftermath of this conflict, but a jarring emotional and mental human one as well. Reconstructing Ukraine may be a trillion-dollar endeavor, but most of what the war has taken can never be replaced. But what do you think about the West's financial support in its defense against Putin's aggression? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Here's something you've probably heard a lot of in the last few months. Russia is running out of tanks. But while this refrain was once something of a joke, now more than half a year into the invasion of Ukraine, it looks like a new reality, and you won't believe how bad it's gotten. As of August 2023, the numbers are truly staggering. According to the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Russia has lost an estimated 4,330 tanks and 8,400 armored combat vehicles, not to mention over 250,000 soldiers. While these numbers are likely inflated to some degree, anything even close to these figures represents most of the country's pre-war supply of armor and will have long-lasting implications for both Russia and the international community. Similarly, a recent open-source investigation by Norwegian researcher Ragnar Gudmundsson shows that Russia is definitely relying on more and more older tanks. He found that in the first days of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, 71% of the lost tanks accounted for vehicles modernized or produced in the Russian Federation, and just 29% were Soviet-era models. However, as of June 2023, it was a very different situation. 73% of lost Russian tanks originated from the Soviet Union, while only 27% were newer types. This strongly suggests that Russian tank supplies have reached a tipping point where they can no longer be replaced. It could also change the dynamics of this grinding conflict, potentially signaling that the Russian war effort is finally running out of steam. So let's dive into how this happened and just what it means for the future of the war in Ukraine. All right, let's circle back to Putin's ongoing battle to hang on to his tanks. And honestly, by now, there's no surprises here. This guy's lack of skill is starting to feel like an endless saga. 
Reports over the summer have confirmed that Russian tank losses are so heavy that the country has moved many of its ancient Soviet tanks out of storage. This includes the T-54 and T-55, which are more than 75 years old and essentially obsolete in today's combat environments. Back when it made its battlefield debut, the T-55 was a highly effective tank, but it entered service just after the Second World War, soon becoming one of the most highly produced tanks ever, with an estimated 100,000 built over the next few decades. As a result, the T-55 played a role in just about every single conflict during the Cold War period and frightened Western countries so much that they rushed to mass-produce their own battle tanks. It was also built to survive just about anything, with a massive 205mm of frontal turret armor and 120mm of slanted hull armor. This armor is so tough that the tank itself survived tests with a 15 kiloton nuclear explosion at only 300 meters away. The T-55 also has a 100mm gun, which was once a threat to anything in the NATO arsenal. But that was the 1950s. Today's modern tank systems make the T-55 look like junk and there is little question which would prevail in a head-to-head -head battle. That's not to mention that T-55s also included a so-called jack-in-the-box floor, which has doomed many of Russia's other Soviet-era tanks. Unlike modern battle tanks such as the German Leopard 2 or US M1 Abrams, which keep their shells away from the crew behind thick armored walls, older Soviet tanks store their ammunition in a carousel-style automatic loader sitting directly below the main turret and crew. A well-placed shot to their thin roof armor can ignite the ammunition and easily blow up the tank. As Professor Robert E. Hamilton of the U.S. Army War College put it bluntly, for a Russian crew, if the ammo storage compartment is hit, everyone is dead. He adds that the force of the explosion will instantaneously vaporize anyone unlucky enough to be inside. So why has Russia been forced to rely on these death trap antiques? And what in the world happened to all its decent tanks? The short answer is that Ukraine happened. The long answer is that years of poor combat doctrine and failure to learn from past mistakes have made Ukraine's stunning success much easier than anyone predicted. Russia's initial offensive into the country last year was nothing short of a disaster, with endless strategic and tactical blunders and ineffective approaches to modern urban and semi-urban combat. This was reflected strongly in the performance of its tank units. Battle tanks are one of the most effective and critical weapons in modern warfare. While jets and bombers are more destructive, they cannot be used to hold and control territory in the same way that a tank can. The main gun of a tank can pin down enemies and even level buildings. Some tanks have specialized rounds intended to do just that. Composite tank armor is also incredibly tough, using layers and structural reinforcement to stop anything short of another tank blast or very well-placed missile and anything a tank is able to blow apart, it can also roll over, making most low cover ineffective. But for all their power, tanks can easily be stopped without proper support. Russia has continually failed to learn this lesson, which helps account for the abysmal performance of its tanks in Ukraine, and by taking advantage of this reality, Ukrainian defenders were able to pull off some of their most astonishing victories of the war. But while this has become obvious to most observers since February 2022, Russia's failure to properly utilize its tanks actually has quite an embarrassing history. For instance, during the First Chechen War of 1994-1996, Russia mobilized its enormous arsenal of Soviet tanks to try and crush the smaller and less equipped Chechen forces. But as Russian troops discovered all the way back then, superior numbers and equipment don't mean very much when executed badly. Lacking their own tanks, Chechen rebels instead relied on anti-tank missiles, RPGs, tank mines, and even improvised explosive devices. Much as Ukraine has, they also use this limited toolkit to take advantage of major weaknesses in Russian warfighting doctrine. This doctrine relies on tanks leading the way of every ground assault, with infantry fighting vehicles behind providing close support. But the usefulness of infantry support is greatly diminished when troops are stuck inside vehicles, leaving them unable to detect ambushes or respond quickly. In Chechnya, Rebels took advantage of this by fighting in urban environments and using guerrilla tactics to fire from many positions at once. Firing from above also allows them to target the thin armor on the tank's roofs, often resulting in devastating ambushes. Russia's enormous casualties from a tank-heavy warfighting doctrine with no effective infantry support would be repeated during the Second Chechen War only years later. 
Russia was able to secure eventual victory in both these conflicts by using brutal artillery strikes and the huge size of its armed forces to seize and hold the capital Grozny. But the wars showed some fundamental weaknesses which many people failed to pay attention to. As Olga Olika, an analyst from the RAND Corporation, wrote way back in 2001 that, Failure to prepare for urban combat was a key error the Russians made in both Chechnya wars, but it was far from the only one. Hampered by poor training and supplies, decrepit equipment and abysmal planning, the 1994-96 war presented a stark picture of how much this once great force had deteriorated. It also demonstrated how poorly the Russian military organizational structures functioned when disparate forces were called upon to work together. Sound familiar? It should because today not a single one of these underlying issues had been addressed. Throughout the early 21st century, Russian combat doctrine continually relied on heavy tanks without adequate infantry support, counting on the use of superior numbers and firepower to overwhelm smaller enemies. Issues with training, supplies, equipment and planning were never addressed, while Putin's kleptocratic dictatorship funneled huge chunks of the military budget into oligarchs' bank accounts. Fast forward to 2022 and it's pretty easy to see how the invasion of Ukraine was a disaster waiting to happen. Ukraine is far bigger than Chechnya. While its military is just as fiercely determined and tactically flexible as the rebels were, Ukrainian war planners also took advantage of the same weaknesses drawing Russian forces into built-up urban areas where their tanks were highly vulnerable and unleashing extremely effective ambushes. This was obvious during the first weeks of the invasion, where Russian tank columns rolling into Kyiv were stopped in their tracks by Ukrainian ambushes. As armor and troops poured into the country, General Colonel Oleksandr Syrsky, the head of Ukraine's ground forces, determined that the Russian columns would need to advance along two or three major highways to enter Kyiv in their blitzkrieg attack. So Sierski organized two rings of troops to defend the city, one in the outer suburbs and one in the capital, with as much space between them as possible, in order to minimize damage to infrastructure. He also moved Ukrainian artillery and mobile anti-tank units into concealed defensive positions to the north and northwest of Kyiv, allowing them to easily target the highways and saving them from Russian airstrikes. He also moved Ukrainian artillery and mobile anti-tank units into concealed defensive positions to the north and northwest of Kyiv. This strategy proved to be extremely effective, allowing defenders to destroy many of the slow-moving tanks. Videos like this now-famous 45-second clip released by Ukraine's defense ministry showed entire companies of Russian armor being destroyed in deadly ambushes by Ukrainian hit-and-run teams using anti-tank guided missiles or ATGMs. As Russian columns rolled through built-up urban areas in long, strung out with no infantry support, they were devastated by such barrages. This was even clearer later on. For instance, during the battle for the small town of Volodar. In early 2023, Ukraine placed hundreds of anti-tank and anti-personnel mines in the fields outside the town. Due to the flat landscape and lack of cover, any Russian minesweepers were immediately targeted with artillery fire. Ukrainian troops left corridors between the mined fields only large enough for two or three Russian tanks at a time to roll through. If the tanks moved at all from the cleared path, they risked having their treads blown off, leaving them totally exposed to artillery strikes. When Russian commanders predictably ordered their tanks to lead the assault along these unmined paths outside Volodar, it left them incredibly vulnerable to the same type of ambushes Ukrainians have deployed since the start of the invasion. Hiding in covered positions near the tank columns, Ukrainian hunter-killer teams set up anti-tank missiles on both sides of the kill zone. Without triggering the anti-tank mines, these teams were able to cross the minefields and dig themselves into strategic positions, often hiding in bushes or abandoned buildings. From there, they could fire and retreat with little fear of being hit by tank fire. Much like Chechen rebels, Ukrainians also used building rooftops and windows to target the weakly armored top sections of tanks. Because Russia refused to dismount their infantry to avoid them getting shot, this left them completely unable to fight back. But unlike Chechen rebels, Ukrainian troops have also had the advantage of modern ATGMs, which they have used to incredible effect against Russian armor. These include everything from the more basic Ukrainian-manufactured Stugna P to advanced Western-produced systems like the Javelin, next-generation light anti-tank weapon or NLAW, and AT-4. These four ATGMs have accounted for the majority of Russia's tank losses during the invasion, providing Ukrainians with a highly cost-effective way of handling tank columns. 
As a result, in just one three-week period, Russia lost over 130 tanks and armored vehicles in Volodar, forcing Putin to rely on human wave-style infantry assaults to try and take the position. And in other battles during the war, Russia did actually dismount its infantry troops, but poor training and equipment meant that they failed to properly scan the flanks. When the ambushes began, many Russian soldiers also panicked, leading to a breakdown in the chain of command and chaotic, disorganized retreats. Infantry fled and tried to find cover wherever possible. In some places, Russian soldiers were even rolled over by their own armor. Footage from a later battle at Volodar, shared on Telegram earlier this year, showed two Russian soldiers being dragged under a retreating tank, and a soldier covered in flames running from a tank shortly before it exploded. Complete disasters like this are only possible with badly trained troops, as one of the earliest lessons taught in any effective infantry academy is how to react to ambushes by rallying and pushing out of the kill zone. Because Russian infantry have failed to do so, it often hasn't even mattered that they have dismounted to support the tank units. Multiply this by a year and a half of fighting and it's easy to see why Russia is pulling antiques like the T-55 out of storage and museums. Recent satellite imagery shows that an open-air depot in remote Baratia in eastern Siberia has lost about 40% of all tanks and armored vehicles it had previously been housing. This is Russia's largest known tank depot, suggesting that others may be even more depleted. And with every passing month, the Russian military fields increasingly less capable tanks as they cannot replace their losses. International sanctions mean they cannot obtain the advanced parts necessary to build more modern armor such as the T-90 or T-14 Armata. It's also unclear how many tanks Russia was able to produce even before the invasion. Some Russian sources say that one of its largest tank production plants was capable of pumping out 20 a month, with others claiming slightly less. The country also has two new plants under construction, but even so, its production cannot compare to the staggering losses of more than 150 a month in Ukraine. And anything actually coming off the line in Russia is now certainly not modern. Sanctions mean no modern electronics for targeting or specialized kits like thermal vision. They even affect things as basic as ball bearings, which are crucial to the production of modern vehicles. Before the war, Russia received some 55% of ball bearings from Europe, Canada, and the US. These deficiencies make producing anything more advanced than a T-80 essentially impossible, seriously diminishing the future potential of Russian armor as a whole. Unable to obtain modern parts, Russia has resorted to pushing tanks off the line with only gunners' sights, reducing the range of their guns by almost a mile and a half. That type of distance seriously matters against something like a Leopard 2 or M1 Abrams. Russian tanks will essentially have to engage in close-quarters combat, hoping that they can gain the element of surprise against superior Ukrainian firepower. Needless to say, this will result in even greater losses of armor and soldiers creating a vicious cycle of decreased production and increased costs. Very few governments could sustain wartime production in such an environment, and Putin's government, as the last few years have shown us, is anything but effective or competent. This is especially true due to the economic strain and enormous costs imposed by the destruction of tanks and other materiel. During the first months of 2023, Russia blew through its entire defense budget for the year, and there are no indications that new sources of revenue are opening up. European price caps on Russian oil, import bans, and corruption and inefficiency in Russia's massive oil sector mean that this year it will be lucky to break even. This is a disaster for the country's wider economy, since the Russian oil and natural gas sector has historically been its most economically powerful, accounting for 20% of its pre-war GDP and 45% of its monthly budget. Adding to the economic pain is the fact that Russia is now taxing its domestic oil industry based on Brent crude prices, rather than its own energy prices, meaning energy companies in Russia are paying taxes on revenue that cannot even be generated. In the best case, this scenario will leave the country's oil market breaking even, meaning its funds cannot be used to subsidize the production of new tanks or any other military hardware. Long story short, there really is no effective path for Russia to keep its production of tanks going long term, all while its embarrassingly bad combat doctrine and lack of modern technology ensures that steep losses on the battlefield will continue. While Ukraine has far less capability to produce its own tanks, that won't matter nearly as much if it continues to receive aid from the West. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg recently confirmed that more than 98% of the combat vehicles promised to Ukraine have already been delivered, 
and that means over 1,550 armored vehicles, 230 tanks and other equipment, including vast amounts of ammunition. In total, we have trained and equipped more than nine new Ukrainian armored brigades. This will put Ukraine in a strong position to continue to retake occupied territory. Whether these are followed up by more tanks and armored infantry vehicles later this year or in 2024 likely depends on Ukraine's performance in its slowly ramping up counteroffensive, as well as continued international political support for Ukraine. There is little question that even the current supply of tanks will pose a massive challenge to Russia's ability to hold on to its occupied territory, but it is also a matter of more than just firepower. The UK Ministry of Defense recently wrote that Russia has constructed some of the most extensive systems of military defensive networks seen anywhere in the world for many decades, not just near the current front lines, but also deep inside areas Russia currently controls. Intelligence reports and satellite imagery show a particular effort to fortify the northern border of Crimea with a multi-layered defensive zone built up around the village of Medvedevka including minefields designed to force Ukraine into a choke point. All of this indicates that Russian field commanders are at least now aware that their own losses are a serious issue, and that Ukraine's modern tanks will likely win in any head-to-head -head engagement. Because of this, the coming months of the war may become a standoff, with Ukraine unable to penetrate Russia's defensive positions, but Russia unable to launch another tank offensive for fear of losing its now limited supplies. In the end, as with many wars, the future of this conflict will most likely be determined by attrition. Whichever side can outlast the other will be able to gain the upper hand, especially in the critical area of tank warfare. Russia's experience so far shows that it never dealt with the long-standing issues present in its military and economy, something which has only been accelerated after a year and a half of war and sanctions. Its enormous tank losses certainly seem unsustainable, but only time will tell if they ultimately tip the balance of power in favor of Ukraine. But what do you think? Will Russian tank losses prove to be a deciding factor in the conflict, or will Russia be able to overcome its issues and keep Ukraine's counteroffensive from achieving success? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. As of June 2023, Russian tank losses have exceeded a whopping 4,000 since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. That is a lot of tanks and Putin's troubles don't end there. Russia will have a manpower shortage very, very soon unless Putin orders another wave of mobilization. But Ukrainian losses have not been insignificant either. So far, Ukraine has managed to constantly mobilize their soldiers and replace their losses. But how long before they start running out of manpower too? Will Putin run out of troops before Ukraine does? Let's hear what our military experts have to say. In February 2023, Word got out that a treasure trove of classified US documents had been leaked across the popular social media platform Discord. In those documents were some harsh assessments of the future of Ukraine's counteroffensive against Russia, who had begun their full-fledged invasion a year earlier in February 2022. The more than 100 documents included secret and top-secret files on foreign intelligence, analysis of opponent forces, and briefing documents for US military and government officials. One file in particular stood out. In its pages, the source claimed that Ukraine would be faced with significant force generation and sustainment shortfalls, and the probability that any Ukrainian offensive in 2023 would result in only modest territorial gains if not supported by a sufficient number of troops and hardware. This report was not the first time Ukraine was challenged on whether they had enough men to defeat the vastly larger country of Russia. It's been evident for some time that both Ukraine and Russia have seen a decline in their populations. For Ukraine, the 2014 invasion of the Donbass region and Crimea initiated their population decline. Their population loss has significantly increased since the February 2022 invasion, coupled with the indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas and brutalization of any population that didn't evacuate. Russia, despite having a vastly bigger population, has a vastly different problem. It's huge, aka hugely embarrassing losses of hardware. Russia's hardware problems in comparison to its troop losses are perhaps a more reliable indicator of just how bad the war has been going for them, since tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, trucks and artillery are big and bulky. Their losses are harder to hide and can be counted and identified more easily than individual soldiers. When analysts look at hardware losses Russia has suffered, the numbers are simply staggering. An analysis done by the Ukrainian general staff reports that Russian armed forces have lost over 3,900 tanks, 7,600 armored fighting vehicles, 
6,400 unarmored vehicles and fuel tanks, 3,700 artillery systems, 600 multiple rocket launch systems MLRS, 350 air defense systems, more than 300 planes, 300 helicopters, 3,200 drones, and 18 ships. To put this all into perspective, Russia was believed to have only around 3,500 main battle tanks before the invasion. The best estimates were that they invaded Ukraine with a total ground force of around 150,000 soldiers. An update on June 21, 2023 from the same Ukrainian source suggested that the number of lost Russian tanks has just exceeded 4,000. While the estimate from Ukraine might be biased, those from neutral open-source group Oryx are not. They count only those weapon systems for which they can prove beyond a shadow of doubt that they were destroyed or captured and document each and every loss in their figures. They report as of June 13, 2023, Russia has lost, at a minimum, 2,070 tanks, 894 armored fighting vehicles, 2,454 infantry fighting vehicles, 318 armored personnel carriers, and thousands more mine-resistant vehicles, transports, mobile artillery, air defense systems, and various intelligence, supply, and command vehicles. Since Oryx only includes confirmed losses, even they admit Russia's real losses are much higher. There are several indications of how bad Russian material losses are. One of the most glaring is that Russia has been transporting 70- and 80-year-old tanks from storage yards and even museums and sending them by rail to the front. One such relic was a T-5455 that was packed with around 6 tons of explosives and sent trundling to the Ukrainian front lines, though it was blown up before it could reach them. That tank was built a few years after the end of World War II. Others just like it have been photographed heading towards the front lines from all over Russia. Another surprising display occurred during the 2023 May Day Parade through Red Square in Moscow. Normally, this was the yearly event when the supposedly mighty Russian military would parade its newest and most powerful military vehicles, from tanks, IFVs, and multiple launch rocket systems to portable ballistic missiles, all of them overflown by frontline fighters and strategic bombers. But this year, the world received a surprise, when only a single World War II-era T-34 tank trundled through the parade. President Vladimir Putin was mocked around the world for such a weak display of supposed Russian military might. So it's pretty clear at this point that Russia is indeed running out of tanks, but does it have enough troops to defend its own cities? Even more embarrassing for Putin was the abortive March for Justice that his one-time chef and military oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin launched for a brief 24-hour period from June 23rd through 24th. Prigozhin's private military company, the Wagner Group, was able to capture the major city of Rostov-on-Don without firing a shot and weren't met with any substantial ground opposition until they were within 125 miles of Moscow itself. The only thing that apparently stopped Prigozhin and Wagner was the failure of a popular uprising to join him. He certainly wasn't stopped by any military units. Most analysts believe that's because the vast majority of Russian military strength is all in Ukraine. Additional shortages of men and material have been seen in the Russian oblast of Belgorod, where a series of cross-border raids launched by free Russian opposition units, together with a small number of Polish expatriates fighting for Ukraine, have caused havoc for weeks. The minimal border security forces there have been wholly incapable of stopping them, not until they were supported by heavy artillery and air force strikes. Some reports say that the Russian defense units didn't even have weapons or ammo, since according to Russian law, it was illegal for them to carry firearms. What about the regular troops? Now that we've seen that Russia has suffered a probably massive loss in hardware and material, and doesn't even have enough troops to protect its own borders, we can better understand the level of their actual troop losses and possible remaining strength. According to the same Ukrainian general staff report mentioned earlier, Russia has lost a staggering 213,000 killed, wounded and missing soldiers, sailors and airmen. That analysis includes more than 43,000 killed in action and over 170,000 wounded, many of whom will not be returning to combat. The Independent Center for Strategic and International Studies CSIS, has come up with an even higher estimate. Their report from February 2023 indicated that Russia had lost as many as 250,000 total casualties. In comparison, this total from just the 12 months of fighting is more than all the combat losses Russia and the former Soviet Union had suffered in all their wars since World War II combined. The estimate of 250,000 casualties would have increased by an additional 60 to 70,000 casualties between February and June of 2023. 
In just the first three months of the invasion, Russia suffered as many casualties as it did during its entire 10-year war in Afghanistan. What's worse is that according to the most recent reports, their casualty rate may be increasing. Russia lost over 1,100 troops in a single day on June 8th, as Ukraine has begun to hammer Russian forces with its summer offensive. But what's causing such high casualty rates? One of the biggest causes of such casualties is the outdated method in which Russia is conducting the war. Overall, the Russian military doctrine has changed little since World War I. They rely on masses of inaccurate artillery supported by fighters that perform ground attack roles and masses of human assaults, sometimes, but not always, backed up by tanks. But the Russian Air Force, known as the SVS, has seen high losses as well, due to the large numbers of surface-to-air missiles sent by the US and NATO members. They've been reluctant to fly over Ukrainian territory and prefer to lob bombs from the safety of Russian-occupied territory. Russian doctrine also suggests that if the first human assault fails, keep sending in more troops until the defenders fold. Britain's Defense Intelligence Agency points out that such outdated tactics carry with them enormous losses. Their report states that a combination of poor, low-level tactics, limited air cover, a lack of flexibility and a command approach which is prepared to reinforce failure and repeat mistakes has led to Russia's high casualty rate among its troops in Ukraine. But here's the really bad part. These casualties primarily include the vets and the elite. Indeed, one of the most significant areas where Russia's casualties have had a telling effect has been in their elite units. An example of the losses such elite units have suffered can be seen in the current state of the 331st Guards Airborne Regiment, a part of the 98th Guards Airborne Division, one of the best trained and most experienced combat units Russia has available. Prior to the invasion, the 331st Regiment's size was around 1,500 to 1,700 soldiers. It sent two battalion groups into Ukraine at the start of the invasion on February 24, 2022, for a total of 1,000 to 1,200 men. They suffered heavily in the initial day's effort to capture Hostomel Airport, just outside of Kyiv. The lightly armored infantry vehicles that they were sent in with proved no match for Ukrainian anti-tank weapons and heavy artillery. An estimated 94 soldiers almost 10% of their strength, were killed in just the first few days of fighting. By the end of the year, some accounts indicated their casualties numbered more than 500. Continued fighting showed that the unit was unprepared for the length of the war. Within just a few weeks of the invasion, locals back at the city of Kostroma, where the unit was based, were holding fundraising drives to send the troops warm clothes. The governor of the region, Sergei Sitnikov, a former CO of the 331st, commented a few months later that we need to help our guys so they have decent conditions. When he visited the wounded survivors, he bought with him care packages from relatives back home and civilian drones bought on the open market. If the conditions were this bad for one of Russia's most elite units, then it can only be much worse for the regular army troops. These same high casualty rates have been reported for all branches of Russia's armed forces, but since the best trained, most elite units are the ones that can be most trusted in a fight, those are the ones that can see the most intense combat, often spearheading assaults in battles around Mariupol, Bakhmut, and as we've seen with the 331st, the initial drives on Kyiv. The problem is, as Russia loses a significant portion of their combat veterans, they're being replaced with less well-trained and less skilled replacements. For a while, the Russian regular troops were supplemented by Prigazin's Wagner forces, widely regarded as some of the most experienced urban fighters Russia had left. But Prigazin's abortive march on Moscow resulted in him being exiled to Belarus, and his Wagner troops being split up between joining him in Belarus, signing contracts with the Ministry of Defense, or returning home to Russia. The Wagner forces had been responsible for the only sector where Russia had made any kind of incremental gains since the opening months of the invasion, that being around the area of the eastern city of Bakhmut. According to the U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, who spoke to reporters on May 1, 2023, Russia had lost nearly 100,000 casualties in its 10-month siege of Bakhmut, including about 20,000 soldiers killed in combat and 80,000 wounded. Ukraine have lost about one-fifth as many in its defense of the city, according to U.S. intelligence estimates, or around 4,000 killed and up to 15,000 wounded. It was clear that within the first few months of the invasion that Russia had failed to allocate enough forces for the complete subjugation of Ukraine and had vastly underestimated the number of casualties they would suffer. In September 2022, Putin announced a mobilization of 120,000 new troops, while a law was also passed making it a crime for anyone in Russia to call the invasion a war. Those 120,000 weren't enough, however. 
and further conscriptions raised the total to around 300,000 by the end of 2022. These nationwide call-ups have had a serious negative side effect. On top of losing a quarter of a million men as casualties of war, as many as one million additional young men and women have fled Russia to avoid the conscription. Many of those who left are the young professionals that Russia desperately needs and cannot replace. These emigres have left for various reasons, but their primary reason was to escape the mobilization, along with fleeing the Western sanctions that have caused enormous economic distress within the nation. This has led to a significant manpower shortage across Russia. In an intelligence update released on May 27, 2023, the British Defence Ministry observed that a survey conducted by the Russian Central Bank involving 14,000 employees had determined that Russia's national labour force was at its lowest recorded level since 1998. In addition to losses from the war and emigration to avoid the draft, the survey also showed that the Russian population had previously decreased by up to 2 million in the years between 2020 and 2022, due to several factors, including the poor Russian response to the COVID pandemic, poor healthcare and diet, excessive alcoholism, and an increasingly aging population. Nowhere has this lack of workers been more acutely felt than in the tech sector, where shortages of trained workers have hit the electronics and programming sectors hard. This brain drain, along with continuing Western sanctions, has caused what Laura Solanko, a senior advisor for the Bank of Finland, described as reverse industrialization. This means Russia has not only seen a shrinking of its economy, but has had to replace overseas investment, lost due to Western sanctions, with funds supplied by the state. Solanko reported such policies can only succeed with huge investments in domestic production to replace lost imports, as well as the construction of new transportation links to the east and south. As resources are limited, she continued, this implies less investment in other sectors, including potentially more productive areas. Russia's investments will continue to move away from the technological frontier, she said, which is why she considers Russia's current state of the economy as reverse industrialization. These factors combine to indicate that Russia will have increasingly fewer young men and women for Putin to draft in 2023, if he feels the need to repeat his previous mistake. On top of Russia's potentially catastrophic combat losses and manpower shortages, Russia is also facing another area of concern, the loss of their combat leadership. One of the most widely reported problems regarding the Russian army is a distinct lack of unity of command. Part of that problem is currently due to the combat losses which extend up the chain of command. As of November 2022, Russia had lost more than 1,500 officers in the first nine months of the war, according to estimates by Ukrainian Colonel Anatoly Stefan, and backed up by studies done by the US Center for Naval Analysis. These reports suggest an estimated 160 of those 1,500 lost officers were generals, major generals, and lieutenant generals, as well as more than 150 colonels and lieutenant colonels, 250 majors, 296 captains, and nearly 500 senior lieutenants, in descending order of rank. While confirmed numbers, as with the lost Russian hardware, suggest a much lower number is more likely, it's clear that whatever the actual total is, Russia is losing far more officers of higher ranks than most Western armies would under similar battlefield conditions. As noted previously, one of the few areas where Russian military has been successful is with its private military companies, like Wagner, but there have been highly publicized clashes between Prigozhin, Wagner's leader, and the Russian military leadership in Moscow. Prigozhin has complained on multiple occasions that his private military group's needs have not been met. Meanwhile, whenever a high-ranking officer from the regular Russian army was fired, Prigozhin has been hiring them and adding them to his own private army, further distancing himself from Moscow. Prigozhin's march on Moscow was responsible for another loss for Russia. General Sergei Serovkin, the deputy commander of the Russian group of forces fighting in Ukraine, disappeared from public sight following the march and was rumored to be under arrest for knowing about Prigozhin's plan and not informing Putin. Serovkin's disappearance will be keenly felt across the entirety of the Russian military, as he was one of the most reliable ground commanders in the army, having attained his rank through skill and accomplishments, unlike those above him in the Russian chain of command who owed their position due to loyalty to Putin above all else. We've seen the many problems Russia is having with its troop losses and its population decline. How well is Ukraine doing in filling out its army? Ukraine has exceeded all expectations in lasting more than a year against a country nearly 30 times its size in area, 17 million square kilometers versus 603,000 square kilometers, and more than triple its size in population, 
143 million versus 43 million for Ukraine. That widely accepted estimate of the Ukrainian population of roughly 43 million is contradicted by other sources. According to statistics compiled by England's The Economist newspaper, Ukraine, including Crimea and the Donbass, has lost about 16% of its population between its independence in 1991 from the former Soviet Union and the eve of the 2022 Russian invasion. These numbers suggest that Ukraine now has a population of only about 36 million, compared to around 52 million in 1991. But that's to be expected in a country where the invader, Russia, has indiscriminately attacked civilian population centers and has leveled whole cities, like Mariupol, which has seen its pre-war population of 400,000 reduced to less than 5,000. This same Russian effort to depopulate any area of resistance has been repeated across whole regions of Ukraine. According to the Joint Research Center of the European Economic Union the EU, Ukraine will continue to see a steady decline in its population over the next 20 to 30 years, even under the most optimistic of circumstances. The JRC has estimated that by the beginning of February 2023, around 5.3 million Ukrainian civilians had been displaced internally across Ukraine, while approximately 7 million had emigrated to other countries, with around 4 million of those fleeing to nearby EU countries, especially Poland. This means that the invasion has displaced close to 30% of the entire Ukrainian population, both inside and outside of Ukraine. That accounts for the disparity between the pre-war estimates of 43 million for the Ukrainian population and the more recent 35 to 36 million figure. It would seem then that Ukraine could be facing a shortfall of the younger demographic that usually makes up military service recruits. However, those numbers belie the reality that an overwhelming number of volunteers have flooded the Ukrainian army, more than they can adequately train and supply. Since the beginning of the invasion in February 2022, Ukraine has seen a truly heroic response not just from within its own borders, but from abroad as well. An estimated 2,000 to 3,000 foreign fighters are believed to be serving in three battalions of a Ukrainian unit named the International Legion, according to analysts and academics monitoring them. But because the Ukrainian government wishes to keep such numbers private, these numbers are only best guess estimates. In the early months of the war, Ukrainian officials estimated that as many as 20,000 volunteers from more than 50 countries had arrived to help fight against the Russian invasion. But according to analysts and interviews with many of the foreign fighters who stayed, the vast majority appear to have returned home before the summer. Hundreds of the better-trained volunteers have since then been integrated into smaller units that operate independently of the International Legion. These groups, led by longtime regional opponents of Moscow such as the Georgian Legion and Chechen battalions, as well as other primarily Western units with names like Alpha, Phalanx and the Norman Brigade. Some of the volunteers who stayed are being used to train young Ukrainian recruits, though their training is often rudimentary. Where a Western nation like the US would spend up to 10 weeks of training in boot camp, the Ukrainian recruits often get as little as 3-5 to five days, though most will get around 2-3 to three weeks. It's not just the total number of troops that Ukraine has that should be considered, but also the troops who are trained well enough to survive the most dangerous first few weeks of their deployment. It's also clear that the numbers of Ukrainian men and women who volunteered were more than the Ukrainian army could train early in the war. More than 140,000 Ukrainians, mostly men, have returned from Europe. According to a social media post by Ukrainian Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov from March 2022, tens of thousands joined the territorial defense forces. According to the Ukrainian Interior Ministry, between 9 and 12 new assault brigades totaling 40,000 men have been training for months to help spearhead the current counteroffensive. Their numbers were swelled by countrywide media campaigns that called on young Ukrainians, both men and women, to join up to help rid their country of the Russian invaders. One of the leaked assessment documents from February 2023 titled Russia-Ukraine Assessed Combat Sustainability and Attrition, compiled by the US Defense Intelligence Agency, suggested that Ukraine had suffered as many as 130,000 total casualties, including 17,000 killed in action and another 113,000 wounded. Ukraine has been very tight-lipped about their own casualty figures, so these numbers are merely best-guess estimates. Overall, it can be seen that Ukraine does have less population from which to draw its military recruits, while sustaining very large losses over the first year of the war. Offsetting this has been a continued strong volunteer effort from both inside and outside Ukraine. The violence that Russia has unleashed on the Ukrainian civilians has convinced many in Ukraine, who would normally let others do the fighting, 
to step up and join their country in defending against the Russian invaders. No matter how long this war goes on, whether for months or years, it doesn't appear that Ukraine will run out of highly motivated volunteers anytime soon. The original question, will Russia run out of troops before Ukraine does, seemed at first to be an easily answered question. With three times the population, it would have appeared that Russia would simply be able to wear down Ukraine over years of relentless, grinding warfare. But the reality is, Russia's military is on the brink of collapse. Their best units have been shattered, and their ranks have been filled with ill-trained, poorly supplied, and poorly led conscripts. Their once vaunted dominance in tanks is now just a memory, and their artillery is being outfought and outshot by more accurate and longer-range systems supplied by the West. Russia's air force can't gain air superiority over the battlefield, while Russia's economy is so drastically damaged that they simply cannot replace the losses they've suffered in high-tech weapons. Ukraine appears motivated enough and well enough equipped that, if the war were to last another year, or another ten, they'd never run out of people willing to fight to remove the last Russian occupier from their land. But what do you think? How close is Putin to completely running out of soldiers? Will Ukraine continue to be successful in replacing their short-term manpower deficit? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts. When you're trying to conquer one of the largest areas in Eastern Europe, a little over 233,000 square miles to be exact, which is roughly the size of Texas, and you're running low on tanks, trucks, artillery pieces, aerial drones, and trained military personnel, you can be pretty sure you're failing miserably. Add an increasingly evaporating number of military aircraft to the equation, and it's time to hit the panic button. Be it land or sky, Putin just can't seem to hold on to his weapons. And it's not just embarrassing, it's downright self-destructive. In the case of aerial warfare, it is disastrous. For Russia, of course. Here's the thing. Air power should have been Putin's biggest advantage in Ukraine. When Putin's invasion began in February of 2022, experts and analysts were seriously gloomy about the smaller country's ability to defend its airspace. Most assumed that Russia's much-vaunted air force, the VKS, would be able to quickly overwhelm Ukrainian air defenses and gain a decisive early advantage in the conflict. Even the most optimistic assessments assumed that Russia's air campaign would destroy Ukrainian jets on their bases, while using large-scale ballistic and cruise missile strikes to blind the country's surface-to-air missile radars. This would have forced Ukraine to move its SAM systems away from the front lines, leaving it at a severe early disadvantage and increasingly vulnerable to Russian sorties. But these predictions, often from top conflict analysts, proved to be completely wrong. In more than a year of war, Russia has utterly failed to establish air superiority, while managing to lose staggering quantities of its jets and other assets. In fact, the situation is so bad that earlier this month, one pro-Russian blogger on Telegram, usually cheerleaders for the invasion, stated that the country's air force has engaged in complete idiocy and is detached from reality. Definitely not a good look for Putin. So how has this colossal embarrassment happened? As usual, there's no single answer here. But like other aspects of Russia's failure in Ukraine, it has a lot to do with the long-term issues plaguing the country's military. Corruption, bad strategies, poor training, and more. These certainly aren't new issues, but the war in Ukraine has exposed how much they've come to affect Russian capabilities. To get a better picture of how this has happened, let's start with a super quick look back at both fighter jets and air defense systems from the starting point of the most exciting eras in aircraft development the Jet Age. The so-called Jet Age kicked off in the late 1940s, spurred by profound changes in the field of aeronautics. The jets developed during this period could fly faster, higher, and farther than older piston-powered aircraft. This would soon come to transform the aviation industry in both its commercial and military forms. By using the technology of jet propulsion, many pilots believed they could outrun their enemies in the skies and theoretically create total air superiority. Using jet propulsion, aircraft could vastly increase their speed, a major reason why aircraft-mounted guns were mostly replaced by missiles. By far the most reliable way to shoot a supersonic jet out of the sky. Still the go-to weapon for aerial combat today, aerial missiles also revolutionize the nature of air defenses. Today they rely almost entirely on surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, to prevent hostile attacks from the sky. And from the 1970s onwards, it also became possible for infantry troops to take down aircraft with their own portable handheld anti-aircraft missiles. These man-portable air defense systems, or man pads, are highly cost-effective shoulder-fired rockets able to lock onto aircraft using infrared homing. 
They are also easy to use, able to be taught to new recruits in a matter of minutes or hours. And since the start of last year, Ukrainians have shown the world just how valuable man pads can be. As Putin's invasion began, Western nations assumed the Russian Air Force would be among the most significant challenges for Ukrainian defenders. When Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov visited Washington in November 2021 to press for weapons, he reportedly told American officials, we have to prepare now. Point number one is air defense. So NATO members sent thousands of man pads into Ukraine to shore up the country's surface-to-air capabilities. Among others, these weapon transfers have included American-made Stingers, high-velocity British Star Streak missiles, and even surplus Soviet EGLOS systems. And this decision really paid off. These comparatively cheap air defenses managed to stop Russia from obtaining air superiority by imposing asymmetrical costs on any Russian pilot dumb enough to enter Ukrainian airspace. For example, using one 60 to 80,000 IGLA missile, Ukrainian soldiers have been able to down a $36 million Su-34 bomber or an $85 million Sukhoi Su-35S fighter jet. This huge cost differential has had effects across the battle space in Ukraine. Because modern combined arms warfare is highly dependent on air support, Russia's failure to dominate the skies has had serious repercussions. The inability to provide sufficient air cover for its tanks, infantry, artillery, or supply lines is one of the reasons Russian forces have taken such devastating losses. Caught in the open, these troops have been falling prey to a range of Ukrainian ambushes from hidden positions on the ground. But does the failure by Russia to achieve air superiority mean a lack of Russian aircraft? Kind of, but not exactly. Ukrainian troops near the front lines around Bakhmut have told reporters that Russia continues to fly daily sorties in hopes of catching their targets unaware. Most of these flyovers last only moments. Russian fighter jets or bombers, often flying in groups of four, fly at low altitude over a target area before quickly dropping or firing their payloads and hightailing it back to their bases. Less maneuverable attack helicopters will also fly right up to the line of combat before firing their missile salvos and quickly fleeing to safety. Another reason for this is the recent addition of the powerful Slovakian S-300 missile defense system to Ukraine's arsenal. This longer-range surface-to-air missile can target Russian jets at higher altitudes, forcing them to fly lower to screen themselves from attack. And in turn, the lower-altitude flights have made them extremely vulnerable to shoulder-mounted missile systems. Because of the medium-range S-300s and shorter-range threat posed by Ukrainian manpads, no Russian air assets are able to spend extended periods of time near the front. Despite the obvious difficulty of shooting down even a low-flying aircraft, the Ukrainian strategy seems to be working pretty well. One report from mid-May 2023 suggested that Ukraine had downed four aircraft in a single day of fighting. While Ukrainian commanders would not confirm their role in the attack, the country's defense ministry stated that the Russian craft ran into some trouble. Numbers like this highlight the focused and effective use of manpads with soldiers using constant vigilance around the clock to exploit the tiny 3-5 second firing window. Ukraine's surprising ability to contest its airspace was also partly what allowed it to go on the offensive late last year. Some of this was done with Turkish-made Beraktar drones, which were used to destroy high-value targets like Russian surface-to-air missiles. This strategy, one that Russia has failed in executing itself, allowed Ukraine to launch more attacks from the air without fear of being shot down. Ukraine also used what limited air power it had in some very creative ways. During the sinking of the Russian Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, Ukraine used a drone to distract the ship's anti-air capabilities before launching a salvo of Neptune anti-ship missiles before the unlucky crew could react. Other tactics have included dispersing aircraft and air defense units out of major airfields, vacating certain air defense positions before they could take any losses from Russian fire, and operating their air defense SAM batteries as pop-up units, rather than large batteries with support vehicles. This final tactic proved to be extremely valuable, stopping Russian forces from effectively targeting most of Ukraine's air defenses. While we now take for granted that Ukrainian soldiers will find creative and deadly ways to use its lesser capabilities, it is still no small feat. In fact, the creative use of air power highlights that Ukraine may now have a better understanding of air operations than even many NATO countries. David A. Deptula, a retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant General, has argued that the West can actually learn from Ukraine here. We've become so dominant in the air that we've never had to think through how we would use air power if we were the inferior force, he said. Ukraine is posing us some very interesting questions that we should seriously consider, if only to understand how a clever opponent would take us on. 
Russia, on the other hand, has continually failed to learn from their abysmal performance in the skies. And as with so much else, Russia's systemic failure to establish air superiority also points to the larger issues within the country's military. This became noticeable early on in Ukraine, when rather than overwhelming force, only one or two aircraft at a time conducted strikes against targets in and around Ukrainian cities close to the borders, including Kyiv, Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernihiv, and Mariupol. And when pilots missed their targets, they very rarely mounted follow-up strikes. At that same time, Russian military planners apparently made no plans for large-scale bombardments of air defenses themselves. In fact, they have seemed entirely unable to coordinate the large, complex formations necessary for fighter jets and helicopters to cover each other from enemy fire. More than almost anything else, this helps explain Russia's baffling inability to establish control over the skies, despite its qualitative and quantitative advantages. Western air forces have long taken for granted the ability to coordinate the timing and positioning of their attacks in campaigns like the Balkans, Iraq, or Libya. However, the level of planning, logistical, and command and control capacity needed for such air campaigns is massive. Every pilot needs to coordinate and understand their role in the broader operation, including the exact timing and route needed to strike multiple targets. Tanker support is also critical to ensure refueling can take place at established rendezvous points. The complexity only increases once actual combat begins, as various fighters tasked with destroying air defenses, those engaging enemy aircraft, bombers, electronic warfare escorts, and search and rescue teams must all work seamlessly together and adapt at a moment's notice. Russia has failed on basically all of these fronts. Many Russian pilots are trained to fly exclusively in pairs or fours, with little exposure to larger maneuvers or formations. They also get far fewer flying hours than NATO crews, do not have tanker support for most operations, and are not trained in large-scale aerial combat doctrine. Lacking all these elements, it's no wonder that Russia could not carry out a Western-style air war against Ukraine. And even in the instances where the Russian Air Force scored victories against Ukrainian positions, they were unable to capitalize on those strikes due to fear of man pads and larger surface-to-air missile systems. When Russia refocused its troops in the Donbass region during April of 2022, they were able to gain some localized air superiority near the new front lines, mainly through the use of artillery strikes against Ukrainian SAMs. But even when they were actually able to gain this limited control of the skies, Russia utterly failed to turn it into any type of concrete battlefield advantage. As one analyst from the London-based Royal United Services Institute, or RUSI, put it, the primary reason for this is that despite having more than 300 modern fast jets with theoretically flexible capabilities to carry a range of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground munitions, most Russian aircrew have very limited opportunities to drop precision-guided munitions in realistic training scenarios. Another major factor is actually hitting their targets, as many of Russia's jets do not have targeting pods, a standard feature on most Western military aircraft. In fact, while Russia's Su-34 fleet of jets have forward targeting systems and can use precision-guided munitions, they're just about the only ones. The rest of Russia's fighter jets have very limited capability to identify and destroy any battlefield targets which do not show up on radar. This means they've pretty much been limited to attacking fixed targets with satellite or TV-guided weapons or dropping unguided bombs and rockets at predetermined coordinates. One observer noted they are literally cratering empty fields, while an anonymous official from the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency told reporters early this year that under half of all Russian missiles are hitting their aim point. We're holding Russian missile success at just below 40%. In Donbass, this incredibly poor performance has meant Russian jets cannot effectively support ground operations, leaving troops open to a range of ambushes and other tactics. But how did the Russian Air Force end up in such a sad state, especially when Putin ordered a modernization of the fleet just a decade ago? The answer, as with so many things in Russia, seems to be a product of the country's structural issues. While the modernization was supposedly intended to make modern combined force operations easier, it appears to have been mostly for show. One part of this has been inefficiency and widespread corruption. For example, in 2012, one Russian arms company received nearly $26 million to develop an aircraft system for intercepting non-strategic missiles. But the research never actually happened. The company signed the fraudulent contracts with shell companies, the addresses of which were registered to the addresses of public toilets in the Russian city of Samara. In another case from 2016, 
one company responsible for supplying radio navigation equipment and control systems for guided munitions, had a similar scandal. Its top leadership were caught in an embezzlement scheme where they faked research and development techniques in order to steal millions through fraudulent contracts. This type of corruption is common and widespread, also reaching beyond Russia's military-industrial complex and into the top levels of its political elite. So much personal wealth is on the line that some experts argue it has completely changed the incentive structure for Putin's top officials. Most of these individuals own property far beyond their official levels of income, signaling a range of corrupt deals. In turn, these security officials have less incentive to give actual expert advice, which could disappoint Putin and lose them access to their sweet kickbacks. And as mentioned before, poor training and an inflexible command structure compounds these issues. As Phillips O'Brien, professor of strategic studies at University of St. Andrews, has written, though much was made of the flashy new equipment, such as the much-hyped Su-34 strike aircraft, the Russian Air Force continues to suffer from flawed logistics operations and the lack of regular realistic training. Above all, the autocratic Russian kleptocracy does not trust low-ranking and middle-ranking officers and so cannot allow the imaginative, flexible decision-making that NATO air forces rely upon. So, when Russian pilots actually have a chance to act flexibly and change their attacks to hit something, bad commanders and rigid doctrine do not allow them to improvise. Instead, they have to try to pull off their standing orders, even if those are likely to fail or lead to their untimely demise from Ukrainian air defenses. It really doesn't look like the situation will get better for the Russian Air Force either. The VKS has shown no sign of changing tactics and seems very hesitant to even use its best jets in the field. This might be because Western sanctions have hit the Russian aerospace industry particularly hard, quickly eroding Russia's ability to obtain the components needed to produce new advanced fighter jets. This became evident in a January call where Putin publicly attacked Denis Mantharov, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Trade and Industry. Previously a favorite of Putin, Mantarov was humiliated when he explained that the country was unable to obtain the contracts needed for new parts. One Moscow-based defense analyst even told reporters that you have to ask yourself if Mantarov is going to be the next one of Putin's cronies you read about mysteriously falling out of a window somewhere. But the corruption, sanctions, and mounting losses of aircraft in Ukraine seem to have made actually getting the parts an impossible task. This is pretty obvious when we take a look at Russia's three production facilities for Sukhoi aircraft. Despite their massive size, analysis from last year shows that they only produced 31 aircraft during 2022, falling far short of the orders placed in state defense contracts. Essentially, as RAND Corporation analyst John V. Paracini recently put it, Russia's aerospace sector isn't likely to have aircraft to sell, even if it wants to. At the end of March 2023, Ukraine's armed forces general staff claimed at least 305 aircraft had been destroyed since the start of the war. While Russia has reportedly even resorted to stripping the microchips from household appliances to replace its losses, it isn't nearly enough. One Ukrainian defense executive stated that production for some of the most critical subsystems for Russian fighters has almost seized up. Problematic items like the Su-35's Irbis passive electronically scanning array radar antenna can require a year or more and that is in times of no embargoes, no supply disruptions. These problems are even greater for Russia's fleet of bombers, such as the Tupolev 295 and 222M3. While Russia has maintained some domestic production capacity for its fighter jets over the years, mainly due to demand from abroad, this isn't the case for bombers. Once the current fleet begins to break down, there is literally no way for Russia to replace them. This is one of the main reasons why many analysts and experts now call Russia's equipment losses in this area irreversible, with no chance of restoring stockpiles to pre-war levels. The situation for Russia's air force is also likely to get worse once Ukraine begins receiving the Western F-16s. Retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dan Hampton stated in a recent interview that compared to an F-16, the Russian Su-35 is essentially junk, adding that our planes are more durable. I wouldn't bet in combat on the Su-35 or any Russian-made aircraft. F-16s are versatile, multi-role combat aircraft, which come in one- and two-seater models. Since 1979, the F-16 has been continuously upgraded, giving the newer models advanced radar and other capabilities. With a top speed of 1,500 miles per hour, a 33-foot wingspan, and 50-foot length, Hampton points out that the F-16 is very hard to see because it's smaller than most aircraft, especially when it's aimed directly at you. 
Each also has one M61A1 20mm multi-barrel cannon and can carry six air-to-air -air missiles. While this payload can pack a serious punch, the Russian planes should also be deadly if used correctly. The Su-35 is a twin-engine, single-seat fighter jet, which the RAND Corporation has called Russia's signature heavy fighter bomber. While the Su-35 is reportedly faster than the F-16, able to reach Mach 2, it does not have the same powerful active electronically scanned array radar, making it a more vulnerable and obvious target. Colonel Hampton has pointed out that the Su-35 is easy to use, easy to pick up on radar, and easy to shoot at with a long-range missile. Part of this is because it's such a large plane with a 50-foot wingspan and a length of nearly 70 feet. And as Hampton stated, the Su-35 is a typical Russian machine and looks good, but deep down it's not really that good of a plane. But which jet is actually superior? Well, it really might come down to who is using it. As David Jordan, co-director of the Freeman Air and Space Institute at King's College London pointed out, that on paper, it can be argued that the Su-35 has an edge over the sorts of F-16s the Ukrainians are likely to get but that doesn't tell the whole story. Like anything else, the effectiveness of each jet will depend largely on its pilot, their training, and the tactics they employ. Seeing as Ukrainians have already held their own so effectively, there is reason to believe this won't change soon. Combined with their use of man pads, Jordan has argued that I would suspect that the F-16s in Ukrainian hands will represent a formidable challenge. Other experts suggest that the context in which a battle occurs will determine how well the F-16s stack up to the Su-35. Retired British Royal Air Force Commodore Andrew Curtis told Newsweek that if it comes to dogfighting, the F-16 is still one of the best in the world. However, the Russian pilots are likely to try and fight a standoff battle using medium and long-range missiles. If they can do this successfully, that may tilt the balance in the Su-35's favor. But regardless, it seems unlikely that Russia will be able to achieve more than the brief localized air superiority it held last year. Since Ukraine's capabilities are only growing, with more and more Western support, there is little chance of Russia making any real gains. With Russia hemmed in by man pads and other surface-to-air systems, and unable to replace or make more of their advanced jets, it seems only a matter of time before Ukraine starts to retake the airspace in its east. So, to sum things up, it has truly been a terrible year for the VKS. The war in Ukraine has exposed its fundamental weaknesses, while sanctions and enormous losses have seriously harmed its future outlook. Unable to even use the advanced jets it currently has correctly, Russia's air force is not likely to see any improvement soon. Ukraine, on the other hand, has been able to adapt and use superior tactics to overcome its numerical weaknesses. Once the Ukrainian air force gets its hands on some F-16s, the tide of war may turn even faster. But what do you think? Why has Russia's air force been failing so badly? And will Ukraine continue to hold its own in the skies? Let us know what you think in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content. First tanks and now submarines. Putin can't seem to keep hold of his weapons, with Russia's only aircraft carrier catching fire not once, not twice, but three times since 2018, and his guided missile cruiser the Moskva sinking in 2022, Russia's navy, widely considered one of the most powerful in the world, has seen better days, and now Russia's submarine power is under serious threat. Here's why. It's no secret that things haven't been going well for Russia, from crushing sanctions to staggering military casualties. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has backfired in a host of unexpected ways. It has also highlighted profound weaknesses in Russia's military capabilities, exposing them as aging, corrupt, and poorly led. Nowhere is this more true than at sea. Despite statements by former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev back in 2009 that, without a navy, Russia does not have a future as a state, the country's surface fleet remains embarrassingly inept. Former US Navy Admiral James G. Foggo recently noted that it has been allowed to atrophy due to factors like poor maintenance, low funding, and corruption. This trend has been on full display during recent years with the Russian Navy suffering a number of embarrassing high-profile mishaps. Its only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, nicknamed the unluckiest ship in the world, has caught fire at least three times since 2018. Earlier this year, Ukrainian intelligence assessed that the ship is in critical condition and not capable of moving under its own power. That's not to mention the sinking of Russia's Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, in April 2022. 
But now there's an even bigger problem for Putin, one deep below the waves. For all the issues with its surface fleet, Russia's current fleet of 58 submarines have been long considered among the most powerful in the world. This includes 11 nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs, 17 nuclear-powered attack subs, and 9 nuclear-powered cruise missile subs, with several more on the way next year. While they haven't been a factor in Ukraine, they are still considered a critical threat by the US military. However, their power may not last forever. Recent reports suggest that Russia's submarine capabilities are being seriously harmed by the backlash to its invasion, especially through the crippling effect of Western sanctions. So what does that mean for the future of the Russian military? And just how serious of a blow could it be to Putin's war machine? To understand just how critical Putin's submarine problem could be, we first need to take a quick look at some Russian naval history, which, funnily enough, is permeated with continuing and humiliating losses of fleets. But wait, there's a plot twist, and it occurs just after World War II. Russia has had military power at sea in one form or another since 1696, when Peter the Great first established the Imperial Russian Navy. Impressed by his visits to Western Europe, Peter realized that Russia could never be a true great power while remaining landlocked. By 1710, he had over 58 ships in his fleet, and despite some defeats, by Peter's death in 1725, Russia was the dominant sea power in the Baltic. During the reign of Catherine the Great, the empire's ambitions at sea had grown, establishing a new Black Sea fleet and annexing Crimea for the first time in 1783. By the time of her death in 1796, Russia possessed the world's largest navy after Britain. This period was the height of Russia's imperial naval power. As naval historian Robert A. Theobald once put it, to my mind, the death of Catherine marks the high watermark in Russian naval history. From this date to the end of the Imperial Navy, it was on a treadmill working hard but getting nowhere. This became obvious during the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, where Russia suffered a stinging defeat to the combined forces of the Ottomans, France and Britain. The shortcomings of the Imperial Navy were even more obvious by the time of the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. But it gets worse. In response to Russian expansionism in the Far East, the newly industrialized Japanese military gave Russian Tsar Nicholas II a humiliating defeat at sea. The war marked Japan's emergence as a great power and contributed heavily to the First Russian Revolution of 1905. Following the Second Revolution in 1917, what remained of the old Imperial Navy came under control of the Soviet Union. And while Lenin and Stalin both aimed to rebuild a powerful Soviet Navy, it remained largely inept throughout both world wars and into the early 1950s. As Theobald described it in his well-known 1953 presentation at the US Naval War College, this is the history of a navy which has lost more complete fleets than any other navy in the world. It is the history of a navy which has never been more than second rate, that has never been decisive in world history, and that has never developed a depth of tradition to compare with those of the Western navies. But this would change drastically only a few years after his assessment, mainly due to one factor – modern submarines. While Russia had some early submarines before World War II, the first modern Soviet ballistic missile submarines were completed in the late 1950s. These early Soviet models were diesel-electric and based on designs pioneered by the Germans, similar to the United States. However, by 1960, the Soviet Navy had launched its first nuclear-powered attack submarines, giving the USSR below-surface capabilities greater than perhaps any country except the US. Soon after, the Soviets also developed nuclear SSGN-class subs, running on nuclear power but designed to launch limited ballistic missile strikes against American aircraft carriers and other naval deployments. Over the next three decades, the Soviet Navy continued to build and maintain a large fleet of submarines, relying on them heavily to challenge America's greater military strength during the Cold War. Because the true names of Soviet subs were rarely known abroad, most are still referred to by NATO codenames, such as the Alpha-class nuclear subs. These use liquid metal-cooled reactor propulsion systems and titanium hulls, enabling them to move extremely fast, over 43 knots, or 80 kilometers an hour, at an operational depth of 2,000 feet, or 600 meters. Also important to Soviet deterrence and power projection were the Typhoon-class subs. The largest submarines ever built, typhoons are over 563 feet, or 172 meters long. 
have a beam of 81 feet or 25 meters and can carry up to 20 sturgeon nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. These were just a few of the many varieties of subs developed by the Soviet Navy, and the Soviets also continued heavily building diesel-electric models as well, such as the Kilo-class attack subs and others. The fleet was never able to make the switch to fully nuclear-powered, largely due to budgetary and technological constraints. However, by its peak in 1980, the USSR's submarine force had 480 boats, including 71 fast attack and 94 cruise and ballistic missile submarines. Even following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, this submarine fleet remained a major part of Russia's naval power. Dmitry Gorenberg of the Center for Naval Analyses has noted that during the post-Cold War period, Putin has focused on developing new submarine capabilities, while Russia has essentially lost the ability to construct new, advanced surface vessels. The most advanced of these submarine developments are the Yasin and updated Yasin M-class SSGNs. Developed in the 1990s and early 2000s, Rand Corporation researcher Edward Geist has described these as the crown jewel of the contemporary Russian Navy and perhaps the pinnacle of present-day Russian military technology. And according to Admiral Fogo, one major advantage of the Yasin class vessels is that they are very quiet, which is the most important thing in submarine warfare. They can also carry both Sircon hypersonic and long-range caliber cruise missiles. Yet these deadly subs also come with a hefty price tag. The Severa Davinsk, the first Yasin class model, reportedly cost over $1.6 billion. While this is still much cheaper than the US's most advanced subs, it is a very high price tag considering Russia's far smaller economy. In the past few years, Putin's government has also claimed that even more nuclear subs are in the works, including what Russian state media claim to be a new division of submarines carrying nuclear-capable super torpedoes in the coming years. Nick Childs, senior fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, has argued that investments in submarines up to this point are one of the only things which has allowed Russia to maintain its status among the leading powers. While its fleet is still far smaller than during the Soviet era, Childs points out that it remains very capable and along with some of the older submarines would still pose a threat to NATO, both at sea and against land-based targets. But even before the war in Ukraine, there were some doubts about the true effectiveness of Russia's impressive-seeming subs. While they are doubtless in better shape than its surface fleet, they have never been truly tested in combat. So how are Putin's submarine fleets faring in the Russo-Ukraine conflict? On land, the reckless nature of Russian military doctrine has been on full display in the invasion of Ukraine. But despite the enormous losses by Russia's ground forces, its navy has so far played a very limited role in the conflict. This includes its submarines, which have remained mostly as a nuclear deterrent and threat. The exception to this is Russia's Black Sea Fleet, where submarines off the coast of Sevastopol and Novorossiysk have been used to fire caliber missiles into Ukraine. None of these subs have so far been damaged or destroyed and there are still concerns that they could be used to counter NATO activity and control trade routes in the Black Sea. But the consequences of Putin's invasion have created a different kind of problem for the Russian Navy and its submarines. The crushing regime of Western sanctions imposed on Russia has begun to erode the country's ability to resupply and maintain its military industry. And in December of 2022, the US State Department added even more sanctions directly targeting Russia's naval power. These have already begun to work, cutting Russia off from the technology required in modern subs. As Admiral Fogo told Newsweek in an interview, I think they have been severely crippled by these economic sanctions and by their own foolishness in the war in Ukraine. In particular, the maintenance of existing subs and development of new ones will become increasingly difficult since, when they don't have the raw materials, they can't sustain the industrial base they don't have the manpower, because that manpower is going into fighting the war in Ukraine. Military losses and brain drain make it likely that Russia will lose its ability to compete with Western countries in submarine development, especially when it comes to their ability to project power. Graham P. Hurd of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies argues that the protracted nature of the conflict and the coming Ukrainian counter-offensive undercuts Russian military credibility. The repeated military failures in Ukraine have created growing pressure in Russia to project an image of strength through its submarines, 
In turn, this has incentivized the Russian Navy to take greater risks by using submarines which are not seaworthy and fast-tracking new weapon systems without proper testing. Heard added that submarines are the most expensive ticket item in Russia's military budget and have no obvious utility in this war, so Russia compensates and projects power through acceptance of greater risk. As a consequence, Russia's submarines will suffer indirect and long-term damage the longer the war lasts. Similarly, Heard and other experts have pointed out that the sanctions illustrate just how much of Russia's military-industrial complex was, and remains, reliant on critical Western technology. Without the advanced components for submarines manufactured in the US, UK, France, Germany and elsewhere, Russian development will be seriously stunted in the years to come and there are almost no alternatives to the technology which sanctions have cut Russia off from. Parts from China and Iran, for example, are not advanced enough to meet Moscow's requirements. While experts remain divided on just how dependent Russia's nuclear submarines are on Western tech, it's pretty clear that at least some of the imported components are necessary to build new vessels. These are mostly thought to be technologically advanced electronic components for guidance, communication and missile deployment. Russian defense journalist Alexander Timokhin wrote in January that the sanctions imposed on Russia after the special military operation left a sharp imprint on the country's technological capabilities. The production of radar complexes, communication systems, guided missiles, sonar equipment, and other similar systems has proved to be difficult. As a consequence, these restrictions could make it nearly impossible to build Yasin and Yasin M-class subs and other highly capable boats. Childs from the International Institute for Strategic Studies points out that this trajectory is already visible, as while the newest Russian submarines are very capable, Russia's inefficient shipbuilding industry has struggled to deliver them on time and in significant numbers. Like other experts, he agrees that Russia's construction shortfalls will accelerate in the coming months and years, since this could well be exacerbated by the increased demands on other sectors of the defense industry as a result of the war as well as from the impact of sanctions on certain key components. So what do these deficiencies mean for Putin's ambitions and the future of the Russian military? Well, experts have outlined two main possible scenarios for the future of Russia's submarine fleet. One possibility is that as military resource constraints continue to grow, it will lead to prioritization of the elements which have been most impacted, especially ground forces. As of May 2023, Russia has lost nearly 200,000 soldiers a truly staggering figure for a modern military. In turn, as one analyst put it, that will inevitably lead to cuts, or limits at least, in shipbuilding in the future. The other possibility is that Russia will be forced to funnel more investment into submarines due to their relative importance and strategic value. This will mean less and less resources for replenishing ground troops and equipment, which are both cheaper and more expendable. But even if Putin opts for the second scenario, any money spent now is likely to have a delayed impact. Past investments in submarine development and maintenance will carry the Russian fleet for at least a few more years to come, but within five to ten years, it could be a very different picture. Just based on the size and current capabilities of Russian submarines, it will likely remain one of the world's most powerful fleets for the next decade. But after that, things are far more uncertain. Any modern submarine which breaks down in the years could become essentially useless, reduced to just so much expensive scrap metal. However Putin attempts to manage his growing economic constraints, the main role of Russian submarines will probably remain as a nuclear deterrent, and there are also some indications that Putin has already realized just how spread thin his resources really are. In March, Russia's Pacific fleet underwent a series of military drills which were described as a surprise inspection of more than a dozen submarines, potentially signaling a lack of faith by the Kremlin in the readiness or maintenance of the fleet. Readouts from the Kremlin show that Putin recently told Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu that while Russia's priorities remain the war in Ukraine, still, the objective to develop the Navy, including in the Pacific theater of operations, remains relevant. Adding that, it is clear that some of the fleet's assets can be used in conflicts elsewhere. This indicates both that Putin does not believe submarines can make much of a difference in Ukraine and that they remain most useful as a nuclear deterrent. As Russia's submarines begin to break down in the coming years, with no easy way to maintain them or build new state-of-the-art models, the country will also become less able to project power in this way. 
This will almost certainly happen, regardless of where the Kremlin prioritizes resources, especially since casualties in Ukraine show no sign of slowing down. As losses climb higher and higher, and as sanctions continue their squeeze, it may also provoke Putin into even more aggressive and reckless strategies. In fact, there is evidence that this is already taking place. In the past few months, Russia has deployed submarines in increasingly threatening positions. As Michael Peterson, the director of the Russia Maritime Studies Institute, told Newsweek, we have indications that nuclear-powered submarines have been deploying off the coast of the United States and into the Mediterranean and elsewhere along Europe periphery in ways that mirror Soviet-style submarine deployments in the Cold War. Such aggressive posturing is likely tied to Putin's growing issues in an attempt to project a facade of Russia as a true global power, despite an economy less than half the size of California. This weakness is also reflected in overly optimistic predictions for its military-industrial complex. A recent analysis by the Institute for the Study of War (ISW) concluded, similarly to other experts, that Russian officials continue to claim that Russian defense manufacturers are increasing production amidst ongoing indications that the Russian Defense Industrial Base DIB, is unable to meet Russia's long-term economic and military goals. There have been rosy claims by officials like Alexei Rachmanov, head of the Russian United Shipbuilding Company, that submarine production time will soon be cut by 8 to 13 months. But there is little evidence to support this, and in another sign of growing weakness, Putin signed a decree on February the 27th, reducing previous plans to construct at least three nuclear reactor-equipped LIDAR-class icebreakers by 2035 down to just a single vessel. Again, this likely reflects the fact that the need to replenish the stocks of conventional ground weaponry lost in Ukraine will likely consume the majority of Russia's DIB and limit Russia's ability to produce systems aimed at longer-term strategic goals. This includes both nuclear icebreakers and submarines, indicating that Russia's resources are spread much thinner than Putin would like the world to believe. So, to sum up, despite the claims by the Kremlin, there are strong signs that Russia's disastrous strategy in Ukraine has backfired even more than we know. The squeeze of Western sanctions now threatens to render even the deadly Russian submarine fleet obsolete. The longer the war goes on and the more isolated Russia becomes, the harder it will be to obtain the advanced components needed for these vessels. This will continue to erode the country's industrial base, possibly crippling all long-term defense production. And because Russian losses in Ukraine are so heavy, Putin also faces a crisis of credibility and growing pressure to project a facade of power. This has already led to reckless, aggressive posturing by Russian subs and a willingness to use vessels which are not even seaworthy, a problem which seems likely to increase because the Russian Navy has historically been so reliant on them to project power, there is little question that the stagnation of its submarine fleet will be a serious blow in the coming years. But what do you think? Will sanctions and battlefield losses eventually doom Russia's submarine fleet? Or can Putin find a way around these issues and keep Russia as a great power? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. There probably aren't a lot of things that can scare a cold-blooded, egomaniacal Russian dictator like Putin, but there are some. COVID-19, for instance. The guy's terrified of it and makes his staff take PCR tests several times a day, every day. Then there's assassins, independent media, democratic elections, and democracy in general. The probability of being overthrown by his own people and Finland. Wait, what? Finland? Yep. The happiest country in the world with around 75% forest surface and the world's biggest archipelago absolutely terrifies the current head of the Russian Federation. Here's why. Imagine for a moment you're a Russian resident in the port city of St. Petersburg, north of Moscow on the Baltic Sea. It's the year 2023, and you turn on the television to discover that once neutral Finland, your neighbor to the north, is now a part of the NATO alliance. It's a shocking blow if only because you know exactly what it means for you and your family. Putin has been fuming about Western imperial expansion for months now. And as things have gotten worse in Ukraine, you fear it's only a matter of time before you or someone you know is conscripted and sent to the front lines as cannon fodder. The way the propagandists have been talking about Finland's defection to the West and Russia's Baltic access being restricted by NATO nations 
You worry that Ukraine is just the start of a decade of war that will inevitably end on your doorstep. Finland is, after all, less than 125 miles from St. Petersburg, well within range of Western long-range guided missiles now being deployed over the border. You get goosebumps as a chill runs down your spine. The future, as long as Putin is in power, looks very dark indeed. It is a fitting twist of fate that the man who set out to reduce Ukraine to a puppet state and create a greater buffer between Russia and NATO has now induced long neutral Scandinavian countries to apply and, in Finland's case, join the NATO alliance, and adding insult to injury, double its physical border with Europe. During the Cold War, neutral Finland had to be in line with Russia. Fearful of reprisal and repression, it will do so no longer. Now bolstered by its Western allies, Finland offers undeniable physical, material and technological benefits to NATO, and that should scare Putin. If the invasion of Ukraine tells us one thing about Putin, it's that he cannot conscience the prospect of ex-Soviet satellites drifting into Western orbit. Back in 2014, when the war in Ukraine really started, Ukraine was already on this path. A presidential coup had deposed its leader, and quickly Ukraine's very constitution was amended to include a clause saying that the country would immediately strive to meet qualifications for eventual NATO membership. There's a reason for Putin's paranoia. Russia hasn't exactly been on the happy side of history for much of its past. European invaders have picked Russia apart, or tried to at least, at various times, from Napoleon's aborted invasion in 1812 to grueling battles with Germany in both world wars. Putin's heroes, the post-1945 leaders he so desperately seeks to emulate, laid down a strict national security policy during the Cold War that eventually became Soviet doctrine. Rather than sit idly while countries on its frontiers flirted with Western influence, Russia would incorporate them into its own ideological bloc, spanning Eastern Europe. The buffer it created with the Warsaw Pact is still cited by Putin and his propagandists as necessary for Russian independence. Without it, Russia allegedly becomes susceptible to Western invasion. And if you can't see the irony there, you won't see it anywhere. The geography of the Russian frontier plays an important role in this strategic outlook and is thus relevant to our discussion today. Eastern Europe offers far fewer natural defensive barriers than elsewhere, like, say, the mountainous borders between Austria and Italy. As industrialization transformed the face of war in the 20th century, Russia had to reckon with the advent of modern, mechanized forces and armor. In World War II, German advances over the Eurasian steppes covered dozens, even hundreds of miles a day, stemmed only at a massive cost to Soviet manpower pools. Russia has benefited from Finnish neutrality since 1945 for many reasons, but paramount among them is the idea that it simply did not have to worry about the hostilities spilling out across its massive border in a hypothetical confrontation with NATO. That until today would most likely be confined to a small sliver of Baltic territory. No longer. When Finland officially joined NATO in 2023, Russia's border with the alliance effectively doubled. It now has 830 miles of difficult-to-patrol tundra, swamps, forests, and flatlands to worry about. Putin's defensive calculus was altered overnight. He may pretend Finland's accession doesn't bother him, but it does. As Putin told the Finnish Prime Minister in 2022, when we look across the border now, we see a Finn on the other side. If Finland joins NATO, we will see an enemy. Strategically, Russia simply lacks the troops to handle this frontier, since they've deployed most of their available forces in Ukraine, it's a bear of a problem to deal with, one that simultaneously shrinks Putin's sphere of influence and makes his imperial ambition even harder to achieve. NATO 1, Russia 0. The Kremlin's time-tested tactic to place the onus of aggression on its enemies is one it will continue using, portraying NATO enlargement as the cause of its actions, not the consequence. These rhetorical gymnastics are predictable enough. Now that Finland has joined NATO, democratically, we should note, something the Kremlin will not, Putin can use it as the cornerstone of his hateful crusade in Ukraine, a symptom of broader Western challenges to Russian interests everywhere. Putin has sworn that there will be consequences from Finnish and Swedish membership. That threat just doesn't cause the same alarm bells to ring today as it might have when it was issued, but NATO will still take it seriously. Just because Russia may lack the military means to make Finland pay, doesn't mean it will stop talking about it anytime soon. The same goes for Finland. These two countries have a past, and let's just say they could never really play nice. You see, there is real enmity between both countries, 
one that is historically rooted in shared 20th century experiences. Russo-Finnish animosity originated in Finland's membership as part of the Russian Empire until its independence in 1917, when the Tsarist government collapsed. Throughout the 1920s, Finland tried to retain its neutrality, backing out of a last-minute defense alliance with Poland, Latvia and Lithuania at the last minute. In 1932, the Soviets tried to quell Finnish fears by signing their own non-aggression pact. Little did Finland know the Soviets would dole out non-aggression pacts like hotcakes in the coming conflict, treating bilateral promises as loose suggestions rather than binding rules. During World War II, tensions between the Soviet Union and Finland exploded once more when the Soviets signaled their expansionist aims by signing yet another non-aggression pact, this time with Nazi Germany in August 1939. This was the one that stunned the world, starting a global war that would consume the globe. As a result, the sovereign state of Poland ceased to exist, and Soviet leaders set their sights on the next target, the Karelian Isthmus and the border of Finland, just west of Leningrad, modern-day St. Petersburg. It didn't take much by way of negotiation for the Soviets to launch an armored blitz over the Finnish border on November 30, 1939, kick-starting the Russo-Finnish War, or Winter War. The Finnish response to an invasion of a million men is the stuff of legend one whose indomitable courage and resilience have been likened to Ukrainian resolve in its existential crisis against Russia today. As winter set on the Finnish frontier, plucky Finnish ski troops offered stout resistance, inflicting massive casualties on the bogged-down Red Army. Ultimately, though the Finns, lacking any Western assistance whatsoever from Britain and France, proved unable to stop the Soviets from reaching Vyborg in 1940. The invasion taught Soviet leaders it could neither conquer nor govern a territory that size with the forces at hand. The Winter War resulted in Finnish territorial losses, but the Finns avoided a worse fate. It would take a Machiavellian alliance with Germany to push the Soviets out in 1941, and an armistice in 1944 to forever seal Finland's rancor towards its aggressive neighbor. Finland's strict policy of neutrality it had held since 1945 changed overnight with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Today, Finland has simply had enough. Its armed forces stand ready to take up arms with their NATO counterparts to deter any future Russian threat, recognizing as we all should that over the long term, Russia will reconstitute its forces to adapt its force posture to NATO's new Scandinavian presence from the Baltic to the Arctic. Some are calling Finland's NATO membership the biggest development in European security since the remilitarization of Germany in 1955 when Germany came into NATO as a remilitarized state after the Second World War. This begs the question of why. What does Finland offer NATO in terms of immediate military capacity that other states might not? The first is proximity. NATO is now within touching distance of the strategically important Kola Peninsula in Russia's far north and its second largest city, St. Petersburg, on the Baltic Sea coast. The Kola Peninsula, in case you don't know, has been described by the Center for Strategic and International Studies as the crux of Russia's military establishment in the Western Arctic, whose air and maritime capabilities are essential to Russia's homeland defense, Arctic dominance, and global power. Its Severomorsk-1 airbase, Gazievo submarine base, and Okolnaya submarine support base on the peninsula provide Russia with operational readiness in the Arctic, where it can deploy SLBM, ICBM, and electronic warfare assets to defend its positions at a moment's notice. Russia's aggression thus far has resulted in a greater concentration of NATO forces on its Baltic border, a trend it can expect to see continue further north if it continues behaving badly in the geopolitical realm. Starting in 2017, NATO deployed four multinational battle groups to the region, one in Estonia, one in Latvia, one in Lithuania, and one in Poland. Each contains about a battalion's worth of forces, just over a thousand soldiers, together with their equipment, tanks, tactical armored vehicles, a headquarters company, logistics infrastructure, and everything else they would need to fight. NATO cycles new forces through each battle group on a rotational basis. After the 2022 invasion, NATO members agreed to deploy four additional battle groups to the states adjoining Ukraine, a safeguard in case the conflict spilled over into NATO territory. Collectively, the establishment of these four units constituted NATO's biggest regional reinforcement in over a generation. Fortunately, it has not yet. But as of today, NATO has deployed multinational battle groups to Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, 
extending its defensive front with Russia from the Black Sea to the Baltic. Finland's membership takes NATO's forward presence all the way north to the Arctic Sea. NATO's multinational battle groups are combined arms formations, meaning they employ infantry, armor, artillery, and air power in tandem to achieve their objectives. These unique units are extremely mobile, adaptable, and flexible, trained for an array of threats and combat scenarios. The headquarters for each battle group is integrated, meaning each nation is represented at the command post. Together, they bring unique capabilities to the table in order to bolster collective defense. According to one NATO official, these flexible units are mutually supporting and, most importantly, send a message that we're here, we're ready, and we can respond to any aggression. It's now time to get down to brass tacks. What does Finland offer NATO? Finland has a relatively small peacetime military, ranked 51 out of 145 countries by the annual Global Firepower Review. It spends about $6 billion annually on its standing armed forces. The Finnish army, the country's largest branch and one devoted to the defense of the nation, has a cohort of around 23,000 active duty soldiers on its rolls, including active duty professionals and conscripts. This may not seem like much, but it has a reserve potential of 900,000 from which it can draw 280,000 well-equipped soldiers in times of crisis, three times more than the British Army can field. These are subject to mandatory military service and regular training exercises, meaning its reserves are also prepared well. In terms of armored vehicles, Finland's primary tank platform is the highly effective German-produced Leopard 2A4 and 2A6 tanks of which Finland boasts somewhere in the region of 200, 100 acquired from the Netherlands. 179 of these are said to be field-ready. It recently donated three Leopards to Ukraine. Apart from its tank force, Finland fields an assortment of infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers, with over 200 of the former and 1,000 of the latter. One of Finland's greatest strengths is its army artillery, considered by some to be the largest and best equipped Europe has to offer. Among more than 900 artillery pieces, it uses the Korean K9 Thunder self-propelled howitzer, the 155 K98 towed howitzer, and M270 Multiple Launch Rocket System, or MLRS, built by the United States. It also has over 700 heavy mortars, 18 Amos self-propelled mortars, 34 2S1 Gvozdika self-propelled howitzers, 471 light howitzers, and 76 130mm field guns. This is a lot of firepower, part of Finland's plan to have the most firepower in Europe by some margin. This service makes use of counter-battery radars to locate the position of enemy artillery batteries, sometimes giving Finnish troops enough alert to bug out before they are struck. Its wheeled counterparts to the devastating American HIMARS systems have already been wreaking havoc on Russian forces in Ukraine. It has been said that the Finnish artillery has more artillery firepower than the combined militaries of Poland, Germany, Norway, and Sweden can muster. The country offers one of the premier artillery firing training areas in the world, Rovijavi in northern Finland. One comment on an article covering Finland's artillery capabilities stuck out. As someone who did his military service in a forward observer team, the commenter notes, I am very jealous of Finnish artillery. Even if a lot of systems are old, quantity has a quality all of its own, and that goes double for artillery. The Wilson Center has noted that one of Finland's assets is its well-equipped civilian defense infrastructure, which can be rapidly mobilized to assist in times of crisis or war. This is called the Civilian Total Defense, an organization that would rush to ensure the nation has enough food, fuel reserves, bomb shelters, and protection for six months in the event of an attack. This, as you might expect, was created as a direct consequence of repelling the Soviet Union's full-scale invasion in the 1940s and the country's strategic stockpiles showed their utility when Finland tapped into them during the COVID-19 pandemic. Finland is a technologically advanced nation with a host of industrial-grade IT capabilities, including 5G communications and cybersecurity. This means that Finland's membership automatically conferred NATO with Nokia's entire regional network of 5G infrastructure, a major boom in an era of increasing cyber competition. Finland, relative to many other countries, is resilient to digital attacks, currently ranked 11th in the Cybersecurity Index. It is a telecommunications and intelligence powerhouse, which NATO will reap the rewards from for years to come. Finland's accession to NATO has essentially turned the once contested Baltic Sea into a NATO lake. All of its coastal states are now a part of NATO. If Sweden can follow in Finland's footsteps, which many are optimistic it can, 
For the first time since the abolition of the Kalmar Union in 1523, the Wilson Center study observes, all the Nordics will be members of the same military alliance. From a military strategy perspective, the additional geographical depth that Finland and Sweden create for regional defense is extremely valuable for all the Nordic countries, as well as for the Baltics. The extension of NATO firepower extends to other domains. Finland has a fleet of 55 US-made F-A-18 Hornets, fully equipped with an arsenal of American precision-guided munitions, among them the AIM-9 Sidewinder and the AGM-158 Jassim air-to-ground cruise missile. In 2022, Finland announced it will station 64 newly acquired F-35 stealth fighters in Lapland starting in 2026. These will be entirely operational by 2030. Their presence makes them interoperable with NATO's existing Baltic Sea air defense missions, and we predict NATO will further extend these missions into Finland on the basis of its existing Baltic air policing operation. In terms of naval power, Finland has the 12th largest navy in the world, with a fleet including 8 missile boats and 10 minesweepers that will come in handy as part of NATO task forces operating within the Baltic. Fortunately for NATO, Finland already spends more than 2% of its GDP on defense, a number that will only rise now that it has become a bulwark of Western security. Finland is not one to shirk its defense responsibilities. Combining its artillery with highly specialized mobile light infantry units, it will wreak havoc on a much larger invading force and make its ancestors proud. By now, we're pretty sure we've made our point. Finland is a military power not to be messed with. What will Putin do? It's unclear whether Russia has the strategic or economic bandwidth to adequately deal with the security complications posed by Finland's NATO membership. Even without NATO, Finland would pose a serious adversary. NATO has military bases throughout Europe. It still must secure Finnish political agreement to permanently base its forces on the Russian border. But NATO will increasingly be looking to simulate the harsh conditions of Northern Europe in its wargaming exercises. Finland has been rehearsing and training its forces to operate in this environment for decades. Now, at the minimum, it will teach Allied forces to do the same. Russia's strategic conundrum is enormous. If it had sat back for a decade or more, there's a chance NATO would have dissolved on its own, its internal unity torn asunder by petty politics and an overall lack of purpose. Now Russia will have to make a choice on how to engage in the Baltic Arctic region. It will likely do what it always has, resort to grey zone tactics to undermine NATO's position. This hybrid spectrum includes attacks on infrastructure like undersea cables, pipelines, and oil and gas fields, or targeted assassinations, sponsored acts of terrorism, and cyber attacks. It will always fall back on its beloved nuclear arsenal, saber rattling where it needs to project its rapidly diminishing strength. The long bottom line is that Russia can't do much until it pulls out of Ukraine. As the author of a recent Finnish defense report concludes, while Russia will likely try to beef up its forces near Finland in the near future, these won't come anywhere near Cold War levels. Due to the losses Russia has suffered in Ukraine and the slowness of establishing new forces, the report concludes, it is likely that there will be no significant increase in military power in Finland's immediate neighborhood before the 2030s. And that should give Putin great pause. But will it? What do you think? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.